tell you who I am, and then we'll introduce uh, the debater that I am moderating for tonight. My name's Holger Neubauer, and I'm a preacher of the Church of Christ in Lakeshore in South Haven, Michigan. And tonight, I have the privilege of moderating for Brother Steve Baisden, who is the preacher for the Ludington Church of Christ in Ludington, Michigan. And if you've never been to Michigan, now's a good time to visit because it's absolutely beautiful. And in a couple of weeks, we're going to have a follow-up debate. We'll talk more about that uh, tomorrow. But first, we do want to thank the Blue Point Church for hosting the debate, Michael Miano for volunteering to debate for the church here, supporting Michael Miano in his work, and we appreciate uh, his willingness to discuss these matters. Of course, we here have kind of a unique perspective because both Michael and Steve believe in fulfillment. They believe that, in fact, the second uh, return of Jesus took place at the fall of the temple in AD 70, and Jesus returned in the very generation that he promised to return. And for Steve and I, that is a great comfort to know that Blue Point believes that because that tells us something very, very important, that you're willing to open your mind to the scripture. Because if you weren't, you wouldn't believe that. If Michael had not opened his mind to the scripture, he would not have come to fulfillment. And so that tells us that we can have an excellent discussion tonight. Because in fact, Steve has changed his mind, Michael has changed his mind, and as a matter of fact, everyone that I'm looking out to tonight probably has changed their mind on something very, very substantial. And of course, if the scriptures point to a particular teaching and we are found in a wrong position, well, we don't want to be stubborn. We want to open our hearts to God and whatever the truth is and wherever the truth will lead, we'll follow. And so tonight... We want to have that kind of attitude to prevail. And debating can do a great deal of good. In Mark chapter 12, where, where Jesus is dealing openly with the religious leaders of the day, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians, the Bible says in Mark 12 and verse 37, and the common people heard him gladly. So they enjoyed listening to Jesus as he had this interchange with the religious leaders. And, of course, we weren't there, but we know full well that there was a terse exchange. They were trying to entrap Jesus, and yet his arguments were powerful, and they were filled with truth. And because of that, the people heard him gladly. Well, we want to have that same kind of discussion tonight. We want to have the debaters to have that same kind of demeanor, to put forward a scriptural argument, what they believe, and to go back and forward and to see where the strengths and the weaknesses of the positions might lead. Now, when the rabbis, the ancient rabbis, debated, they called the debate the, the pill pool, and they believed through academic debate that ultimately the stronger ideas would win and the weaker ideas would be defeated. And when they had a particular debate, a shamayim, they would want the rabbis to deport themselves in such a way that they were seeking each other's good. And if the rabbis were seeking each other's good and trying to get closer to the truth, they believed that the debate would stand, even if there was disagreement. And so tonight, that's hopefully what we can have. We can have this shemayin, we can have this kind of debate and this pill pool, this concept of academic debate where the strengthening of the ideas can be put forward. And so, Tonight, we're going to debate about Bible baptism and its significance. And the proposition reads, the scriptures teach water baptism is essential for sinners to be saved. And Brother Steve Baisden will be affirming, and Michael Miano will be denying this proposition. But first, let me tell you a little bit about Steve Baisden as he comes up to uh, put forward what he believes and to affirm the proposition which was read just a moment ago. Brother Steve's been a great friend of mine for many years now. I guess about 15 to 16 years. Is that about right? Is he getting, it's, it, it's always more than I think it's been. 
And so years ago, about 20 years ago now, I guess, um, Steve and I met because he was looking forward or looking for a congregation to worship with in Michigan. And he's about 100 miles away. And um, Steve was disappointed with a lot of the congregations. And uh, through mutual friends, we've met. And uh, he started worshiping with us. And so he started driving his uh, family over 100 miles one way each Sunday. I think he missed maybe a couple of Sundays in a three-year period, maybe, because of weather. And uh, we learned to appreciate each other and love one another. And uh, during those three years, I learned to have a great deal of confidence in Steve. Well, after the three-year period of going back and forward uh, to um, South Haven, Steve decided to plant a congregation in Ludington. And there was no church there, at least there was a no church that uh, we thought was worthy of worship. There was another congregation that had become so liberal on so many matters that it didn't even matter what you believed, what you practiced, and uh, that wasn't part of our framework uh, back then, nor is it now for that matter. So um, Steve planted a church, and the church has done wonderfully well, surpassed the number at Lakeshore at South Haven uh, that are with us. But the unique thing about Steve's work is, is that he has a full-time job, and he is the third owner of an expediting uh, business, um, a trucking firm, and uh, he works overnight. And after the debate tonight, Steve will take over the phones for his business, and he'll work till 7 o'clock in the morning. And then he's going to go at it again. I've never really been with any kind of guy, with the kind of energy and fortitude that Steve Bazin has. And when someone might question his motives, because he's a very strong preacher and strong his convictions, and somehow cast aspersions to somehow the insincerity of Steve, let me just say they don't know what they're talking about. They really don't know what they're talking about. Steve Bazin's a good man, and he's done a great deal of good. And uh, I'm glad that he's my friend. And Steve don't, and I don't always agree on every single point, but I don't know of a man that I agree with more than Steve Bazin. So we have found wonderful agreement. We've worked together, and Steve has done a wonderful job. And uh, I had questioned, you know, eschatology for years, and uh, I could share anything uh, that I was thinking about with Steve, and he'd always be reasonable with it. Well, you know, I had... Uh, personally perhaps, um, you know, come to a particular conclusion, but I was not on social media. I, I, I didn't have a connection with the Brotherhood and Churches of Christ the way Steve did. As a matter of fact, I didn't even know what Facebook was all about back then and resisted the whole thing. And so when I got attacked and Steve started preaching, they came after him because he had a presence. And um, he stayed strong and Actually, that became a good time. It took me at least six weeks to figure out how to get on social media after that. And then uh, by then, Steve had already been in battle with every preacher in the Brotherhood and Churches of Christ. Anyways, But anyways, through all of this, um, Steve has done remarkably well, taught a lot of preachers the truth about the fulfillment of uh, the scriptures. And at the same time, he has stayed with certain fundamentals which we affirm. And one of them is water baptism. And so let me read the proposition again, and then Steve Bazin will come and uh, affirm this, uh, this proposition. The scriptures teach that water baptism is essential for sinners to be saved. Brother Steve. Go ahead and start the time, Mario. I want to take uh, a few minutes here of my opening statements and just I want to say thank you to Michael Miano, to the Blue Point Bible Church, to the internet for providing this and making this all possible, and those that have encouraged both Michael and myself to engage in this discussion, I appreciate it. I, I consider it a great honor and a privilege to stand here in Long Island, New York, in your presence today, and I do so with great love and compassion in my heart. So I have no ax to grind. I'm not looking to win a debate. I simply want to give you what I believe the Bible teaches on this matter. So I thank you. Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness. 
Let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head, the psalmist would write in Psalms chapter 141. Let the righteous smite me. What a wonderful, what a wonderful attitude to have. In Isaiah chapter 41, produce your cause, saith the Lord. Bring forth your strong reason, saith the king of Jacob, Isaiah would write. Produce your cause and bring forth your strong reasons. God wants us to take his word. He wants us to analyze it. He wants us to scrutinize it. He wants us to compare it. He wants us to produce strong reasons and to produce a cause and, and, and give validity to what we believe. To share it with each other. Isaiah is welcoming the idea of, of this great dialogue that we can have in a strong, persuasive way. Now, Michael and I are going to engage in a debate. And I may be strong on Michael. He may be strong on me. But I believe our motives are pure here this evening. And I hope you do too. Proverbs 27, 6. Solomon would write, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. If you're wounded tonight from something that the scripture says, and I, I want to make that clear. I'm not going to tell you my opinions. I'm not going to tell you what I think. I'm not going to tell you what I feel. I'm going to give you what the Bible says, okay? If anything disagrees with the word of God, that's wrong, not the word of God. So if I hurt your feelings, if I offend you by giving you scripture, you know I'm your friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. Kisses of an enemy are deceitful. And Jesus would say in Revelation 3.19, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So there may be some rebuking going on. There may be some chastening happening. That's because Jesus loves you. Don't think that's a bad thing. Too many people today think it's all about emotional, uh, fuzzy-wuzzy, feeling lovey-dovey, and, and, and there's no... Paul would write, behold, the goodness and the severity of God. Ah, oh, okay. God had vengeance to come. He had wrath to come. He had the good news to come. And certainly the most powerful thing in this world is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed. The what of God is revealed? The righteousness of God is revealed through the gospel of Jesus Christ. In John chapter 10 verse 1. Jesus would say, verily, verily. He swore this with a double oath. I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. He's talking about entrance into the great kingdom of God. He's talking about in entrance into the church. The church is the kingdom. Jesus said, I will build my church. I'm going to give you, Peter, the keys to this kingdom, Matthew 16, 18, and 19. And he said, the kingdom cometh not with observation. It's not a, a physical thing. It's a spiritual thing. And Jesus said, I am the door. And if any man enter in any other way, that same man is a thief and a, walk, uh, and a liar. Now in 2 John, verse 9, the apostle John would write this, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Folks, I want you to think about that. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Now the apostle John wrote several books of the New Testament, both of Revelation, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, the Gospel of John. Gives a lot of information, gives a lot of dialogue there. And he said this, we got to abide in the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Because John taught the same thing Jesus taught. Paul taught the same thing Jesus taught. Peter taught the same things Jesus taught. They didn't have separate gospels, they didn't have separate faiths. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5, uh, verse 4. For there is one body, one spirit, even as you're called and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There's not different faiths, there's not different baptisms, there's not different bodies. And the body is the church. The body is the church. How many are there? One. How can you identify something that's spiritual? And now, if it's not a physical thing, and you can't see it with physical eyes, pray tell, how is it you can describe this one body, this church? Well, we're to walk by faith and not by sight. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. All right. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. When I read what Jesus said about the church, when I read what Paul said about the church, when I read how they assembled on the first day of the week and how they gave freely as God prospered them and how they taught their disciples to believe, repent, confess, and be baptized into Christ, I know that's the church of the New Testament Bible. Now when I hear a different church saying and preaching something different, 
That's something different than the Bible. That's a different church. That's a different faith. Ah, so whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. I'm here tonight because this is serious business. If you are teaching that people are saved when in truth they are not really saved, friends, you're not preaching Jesus. You're not preaching the truth. You're not preaching the gospel. In fact, you're preaching something that's hurting people. If you say you're saved by faith alone, all you got to do is believe. And you're saved. But God says you must be baptized to be saved. But you got people thinking they're saved at the point of belief. You got them thinking they're saved when they're not. That's how serious this debate is. That's why I drove, Mario and I drove 900 miles. Hoger flew 900 miles to get here today. For this reason, because I love the Lord my God and my Lord Jesus Christ with all my heart, with all my mind, with all my soul, with all my being. I go to the ends of the earth for my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ to help people because I love my neighbor as I love myself. You talk about love? Nah, that's what I'm here for tonight. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18, now watch it now carefully. Not he that commendeth himself is approved, but whom the Lord commendeth is approved. You can say I'm approved of God all you want. You can believe it. You can think it. You can convince your neighbors you're saved. But it's not true unless God says so. It's not true unless God affirms it. How does God affirm it? Through his word. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And faith cometh by hearing. And hearing by the word of God. I can read God's word and I can know when I'm abiding in the truth and when I'm not. I can know when I'm doing things right and when I'm doing not. In fact, I'm being, Michael agrees with me, the judgment has come. It's here. But every one of us sitting here right now in this room is being judged at this very second right now by the gospel. That's the standard of God's judgment. You know right now if you're in sin or you're not in sin, and it's based upon the gospel. Sin is transgression of God's law, 1 John chapter 3, verse 4. Ah, uh -huh. no wonder the apostle Paul would write in Galatians chapter 1. Though we are an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let them be accursed. Because there's only one gospel. There's only one way. Only one door. Anybody tries to enter in this church of God, of Christ, any other way, the same as a thief and a robber, Jesus would say. Now, my affirmation is the scriptures teach water baptism is essential for salvation, for sinners to be saved. There's a couple of things I want to clarify. Usually, debaters will go through and they'll take every word and they'll say the scriptures, by scriptures I mean this, 66 books of the Bible, the Old and the New Testament, Y'all don't need that. I don't need that. You know what water baptism is, and we're going to define it even more so as this debate continues. So I'm not going to go through every word, but I do want to start with this. The idea of sin and sinners and salvation. Sin is the problem. Paul would write in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. Isaiah chapter 59, Isaiah would say, your sins have separated you from your God, that he will not look at you, he will not touch you, he will not hear you. John chapter 9, the Bible says there, and we know God heareth not sinners' prayers. What? I, I know everybody here has heard, say the sinner's prayer. We've all heard it. I've heard it. The Bible says God heareth not sinners' prayers. How's that work if God don't hear the sinners, but you've got to say the sinner's prayer? Now, wait a minute. We're going to get into these things. We're going to define these things. So sin is the problem, and you need to be saved from your sins which condemn you. So salvation equals the remission of sins. I couldn't tell you how many pastors I've spoken with, and I asked them, how does salvation come, or how is salvation lost? And they really don't have a clue, and they just think, well, it's something you feel. Or, no, 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 no. What happens? What has to happen for you to be redeemed? Well, you have to have your sins cleansed in order to have remission of sins. Because if you still have sin in your life, you're still lost. You're not saved. Sin separates from God. So we're going to discuss how to remove sins this evening. Sin is transgression of God's law, First John chapter 3, verse 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is transgression of the law. Now, many people are saying today, we're under grace, we're not under law. You have no idea what you're talking about when I say that with all sincerity. 
In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, the Apostle Paul wrote, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill ye the law of Christ. The what? I thought we was under grace. There's a law of Christ. In Romans chapter 3, verse 21, the Apostle Paul there wrote, We're under the law of faith. What is faith? So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. I'm under what God said. I'm under the gospel of Jesus. That's my law. Well, in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 and 2, there it says we're under the law of the Spirit. You think the Spirit has a law? Oh, yeah. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost told the men what to write. And they wrote, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. They wrote, well, we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we preach unto you. Let them be accursed. Huh. So we're looking at the problem of removing the sin, and we can't think it's by grace alone or faith alone because sin is transgression of the law. Does everybody here I know believe sin exists in the world? I know you, but if sin exists in the world, it's breaking God's law. That's all there is to it. He goes on to even explain that in Romans chapter 5. I'm not, I don't have time to get into all that, but we can see these things. These things now. Another thing with sin, i got to get the definition of these things because we've got to be on the same page. If we're going to debate it, we've got to have the same definitions for these words. Sin can come in two different ways. There's the sin of commission. You commit sin. God says, don't you murder. You go out and you murder somebody, you sin. You broke God's law. God says, don't lie. You go out and lie, you committed a sin. That's sin of commission. But there's the sin of omission. Jesus said something like this in Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Watch it. He that believeth not shall be damned. God says you've got to believe. If not, you're condemned. Why? You've omitted that commandment to believe. If God said you've got to repent, I won't save you. And he did. Luke chapter 13 verse 3. Nay, but except ye repent, you shall all likewise perish. For the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts chapter 17 verse 30. 31. All right. If God says you've got to repent, you don't repent. You're a sinner. You've omitted that sin of omission. If God says you've got to confess me, except you confess me before man, I will in no wise confess you before my father. You better get to confessing because if you don't do that, if you omit that, you're sinning. If he said a man must be born again of the water and of the spirit, or he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven then if you don't do that if you omit that and you say that doesn't work that's a sin so let's get the definition of, of sin real quick now let, let's get to it that's where I'm going right now John 3 5 Jesus answered verily verily I say unto thee except a man be born of the water and of the spirit he cannot enter into the kingdom of God this is talking about water baptism I'm not talking about the amniotic fluid at birth. A man must be born. Again, not a little child, number one. But let's look at the scriptural references. Let's look at 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. Uh, Mike, take a note here, buddy. I'm going I'm to help you, brother. If you know that he is righteous, if you know he is righteous, speaking of the Lord, you know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. Woo! must be born again oh you, oh, you got to do something what do you got to do righteousness well how does righteousness come is it what I feel is it a holy hunch is it a godly guess the psalmist would write in Psalms chapter 119 verse 172 all thy commandments are righteousness the commandments of God are what's righteousness okay but in John chapter 14 verse 18 follow the argument now John 14 18 Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come unto you. He's talking about his second coming here. All right? Now, we understand that. And then he says this, two verses later. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him and will manifest myself unto him. Did you get it? After the coming, I'm going to come again unto you. He that loves me and does what? Keeps my commandments. My father and I will love him and make our abode with him. Who? He that loves me keeps my commandments. Well, isn't that keeping the righteousness of God? Absolutely. That's what John wrote in, in, in 1 John 2, 29. He that keepeth righteousness is born of God. You've got to do what God says do. Righteousness is the commandments of God. Okay. 
In Matthew chapter 24, verse 35, Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word will never pass away. You can't take Jesus' commandments, you can't take Jesus' words, and just arbitrarily say they don't count anymore today. You can't do that. That's not right. You, after his coming, he said, He that loves me and keeps my commandments, my Father and I will love him and make our abode with him. Ho, ho. What do you got to do? Love and keep my commandments. Now, 1 John chapter 2, verse 3. Watch it. It's as easy as 1, 2, 3. 1 John, 2 chapter, 3rd verse. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. If any man says, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, the same is a liar. Don't tell me you know Jesus, but you don't got to keep commandments. Not the Ten Commandments. Moses didn't die for us. The commandments of Jesus. Heaven and earth is going to pass away. My words will never pass away. What we must it do, Lord? Mark 16, 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark, uh, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. All power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Watch it now. And baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I commanded you. And lo, <laughs> be with you all way even to the end of the world. Wowzers. No, we've got to do something. Got to do something. Keep an eye on that marker. Get, let me know when we're down to two, Mario. Acts chapter 22, 16. Let me give you... An example of the greatest believer in all the Bible, the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, the greatest believer of all the Bible. On the road to Damascus, bright light shines around about him and falls to the ground. Who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. What would you have me to do, Lord? Oh, don't do anything. My grace is sufficient. I've done it all for you on the cross. You say that? He said, oh, you're saved by grace through faith alone. You believe in me now? I believe. Okay, you say, you say that? He said, get up. You go to the house on Straight Street. It's going to be told you what you must do. So he gets up. He's blind. He's led by the hand. And the apostle Paul said he was there for three days and for three nights. What was he doing? Number one, greatest believer in all the Bible. Number one. Number two, he was fasting for three days, three nights. Number three, he was repentant. He was going to persecute the Christians. He stops doing that, and now he's doing what Jesus tells him to do. I went to the house on Straight Street. <laughs> number, number four, he's fasting. Number five, he's praying. He's praying for three days and three nights. In the meantime, Jesus talks to Ananias. says, go to the Apostle Paul. Go to Saul of Tarsus. He's praying. Ananias goes there. He's worried. I've heard much of this man. He's done a lot of harm. He's a chosen vessel to bear my name before the Gentiles. You go. So Ananias gets there. He finds this praying, repentant, fasting, believing man. He says, what are you waiting for? Why tarriest thou? Arise, watch it, and be baptized, and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name of the Lord. That's how you call upon the name of the Lord, a biblical example right there. Right there. He had his sins. He didn't have salvation because as long as you have sins, you're not saved. He had his sins for three days and three nights believing, praying, fasting, repenting, confessing. What are you waiting for? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling upon the name. Why did Ananias say that? Because that's what Jesus taught. Same thing. That's what Paul taught. Know you not that as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ? Galatians 3, 20. For we are all the children of God in, in Christ Jesus by faith. For as many of us as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. By faith, for as many of us as has been Baptized and put on Christ. How? Through being baptized. Now, got a lot of more here. I just don't have the time. I was going to get into several other things. Is that time already? In 30 seconds. Let me say this. Right now, at this point, what we've been able to do is establish the Lord's commands are eternal. The Lord commanded baptism. Baptism washes sins away. Baptism is when one is born again. We have Christ's law of abiding right now. It's the law of faith. Except one is born of water, he cannot enter in God's kingdom. Anyone not keeping Jesus' commandments does not know him. And there is only one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. And no matter what anyone else says, these things are true. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Steve Hernandez, elder of the Blue Point Bible Church, and I'm so happy to see everybody here, and I thank our guests for coming such a long distance and, and bringing the Word of God with such passion. Um, you know, uh, 
uh, in my opening remarks, just quickly to get some housekeeping out of the way, you know, we, we are thankful to the Lord for providing this building, and we're very thankful for the setup we have here with social distancing and get exits, which I must mention legally, are in the back of the room and on both sides. Uh, and um, I also wanted to mention um, there's a handout in the foyer speaking about um, uh, uh, Reformation Weekend, and we invite everybody, the online community and everybody from around to come and please uh, attend and, and listen to this wonderful, wonderful presentation, uh, uh, um, really, really focused on propelling forward the Word of God. Um, I'd like to introduce Pastor Michael Miano. Pi Pastor Mike Miano is of the Blue Point Bible Church. He served as pastor uh, since April of 2013. Uh, he's authored and published three books, a testimonial a study through biblical topics regarding wickedness, uh, and also a study guide on the book of Revelation, and he's written portions of a few other books, including one uh, where he was working together with uh, Brother Steve Bazin uh, on Revelation. Uh, he's contributed to Bible commentary and has participated in a number of debates on eschatology, uh, the eschatology being the study of the end times. Uh, soteriology, the study of salvation, and the biblical concept of annihilation. Michael Miano also serves as a director of the Power of Preterism Network and leads a personal apologetics ministry called MGW Apologetics, uh, wherein he seeks to bring reform to the church, most notably encouraging zeal empowered by knowledge, the knowledge in the word of God. Uh, this is done through video teachings, blogs, articles, debates, uh, and, and, and a number of different types of media. Uh, and uh, all for the glory and the grace of God. Um, Pastor Miano uh, continues in the Berean tradition of this church. One of the reasons why I was drawn to this church was it's, it's really uh, thinking nature, the way it studies and its approach to study itself. Um, one of the things that uh, we stress here is sola scriptura. Um, and when we, when we read through the Bible, we look at it as a narrative, it's a story, a complete set of instructions, a gift from God, from cover to cover. It's, it's complete, it's a gift to us, and it contains everything we need to know pertaining to God, holiness, and salvation. Uh, when reading the Bible as a narrative, uh, we, we are very careful to let scripture always reveal scripture. Uh, and we never uh, get into the, uh, a bad practice of playing connect the dots with scriptures. Um, it, we, we really have some strong uh, uh, um, rules in the church when we study in our study groups together. Where we, many times when somebody wants to cite a verse, we'll tell them to stop and go 10 up, continue through the verse, and go 10 down. Very important to keep it in context. We'll also bring up other contextual considerations like who was speaking, what, who were the audience, what time period was it? What was going on in history? Was Paul in jail? Uh, all different types of, uh, of, of things that are basic tenets and basic rules of the English language or any communication to really be able to exegete the message properly in its context, in the way it was intended to be delivered to its audience. And um, uh, we, we really feel strongly in that because um, connecting the dots really loses the concept text and really loses the teaching. Um, there are, you know, I remember when I first came to this church, I was very attuned, I came from another church, in kind of plucking out on creating an argument through um, kind of connecting the dots or pulling out scriptures. And I remember Pastor Chandler, the one who originally brought um, fulfilled eschatology to this church, and he came from a, a Baptist tradition, so it was a real change, and to get that congregation to follow him, it was a real, it was a work of God nothing less. And I remember when I used to come to him as a young Christian, trying to show, show him the things I knew, he would say to me, stop. He would say, Steve, you're almost right. But there are special instructions that come with that scripture. It's the rest of the book, you know? And he would always reframe me, you know? So, uh, so I think that that's interesting. I think that's great. It was, it was just so wonderful to hear um, uh, Brother Neubauer's introduction, and I praise God for bringing these men to us because I could see from his introduction that they're like-minded. They, they want to know the Word of God, they want to rightly represent the Word of God, and they want to let God reveal himself 
through the word in all of its context. So we, we thank God for the opportunity to get together and have this uh, debate, and we really, really uh, are appreciative of our guests, and we thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Just want to make sure I write down my time. So I'm starting here at 7.50. The Apostle Paul explained that his message and preaching were not in persuasive words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith should not rest on the wisdom of men, but on the power of God. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 5. In my estimation, Steve Bazden is going about this all wrong. Much of what he says in regards to baptism sounds like persuasive words and wisdom of men, rather than the demonstration of the spirit and power in regards to salvation. We declare the power of God, not the effort of man. One writer said, any intelligent fool, now let me be clear as I say that, I'm not referring to Steve Bazden. We all know what scripture says about referring to your brother as a fool, and I do view Steve Bazden as my brother in Christ. That being said, the, I thought the quote was good, and I wanted to be clear that I'm not calling anyone a fool. Any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex, and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. My goal tonight is to do exactly that, to move in the opposite direction. I will make the charge that Steve's view makes man's effort and water baptism a bigger deal than scripture proposes it to be. I will make the charge that Steve's plan of salvation and what he requires from the individual is making God's salvific work far more complex than it is. I pray that both of us, and I trust that we do, we endeavor to teach the truth in love, admonish and exhort with all gentleness, rather than violently uh, go through these things. First and foremost, I'd like to thank God for his life and my work, in, uh, in my life, his work in my life. In 2005, while serving time in prison, I truly believe that it was his spirit and nothing of myself that called me, led me, and continues to sustain me in the gospel up to this day. I'd like to thank my moderator, Elder Steve Hernandez, for his willingness to participate and introduce me this evening and share uh, some important thoughts about our church and the way we go about our study. I thank each of you that are here tonight because you being here demonstrates that you believe this is an important topic that we must discern and understand. I thank Stephen Holger for their willingness to travel here, to sift through these things in an effort to rightly divide the word of truth. As many of you know, these are men that I have come to admire. I admire them for their boldness and their teaching effort in regards to God's truth. I might, however, disagree with their tact and these details, of course. However, these men have demonstrated love to me, wisdom to me, and I trust will continue to be a blessing to me and to each of you. I'm in the negative tonight. That means I am intended to follow Steve's thoughts, and I have every intention of doing that. That means I must go up against the things he brings up and mentions. So I'm not so much here to introduce my views or to explain what I believe. My affirmative statements and outline what I believe will be offered up in November in Ludington at the Church of Christ there. Steve's affirmative is the scriptures teach water baptism is essential for sinners to be saved. For my initial negative, I'd like to outline why I'm in the negative to that statement. Let me first start by declaring that I am not a Baptist. And those of you who are sitting here are not sitting in a Baptist church contrary to what Steve recently said on a radio program about me and us. I, we here at Blue Point Bible Church, have labored and continue to labor in undoing the damage of what we see denominationalism doing in the world and very much in Christianity. We undo the damage fostered by biblically illiterate common day Christianity. This very church took a stand in the 1990s and continues to take this stand to move against the creeds of man to be a diligent congregation properly thinking through the things of God, what we like to highlight as a thinking faith. On that same radio program, Steve asserted that from me you might hear a more emotional-based, feelings-oriented sort of presentation. However, anyone familiar with my testimony or with my ministry knows full well that I urge against such a notion. I urge against zeal without knowledge, 
the same thing the Apostle Paul lamented in his generation in Romans 10. Rather, I strive to live and lead with what I call a zeal empowered by knowledge. That being so, there is a basis for a personal, emotional, feelings-oriented reception of the gospel. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, the Lord looks at the heart, not at the outward things that man does or at the outward man. In Isaiah 29, 13, we read that they did all the outward works, all the commandments of the law, but they, their hearts were far from the Lord. And this is what Jesus said about the first century Pharisees in Matthew chapter 15, verse 8. They were doing all the outward works. They were doing all the externals. But yet their heart was far from God. In Luke chapter 24, verses 15 through 16, well, matter of fact, let's just talk about Luke chapter 24. We read there about the, these men walking on the road to Emmaus. And sure enough, what does it say there? As the scriptures were being taught, their hearts burned within them. In Acts chapter 15, we read about a woman named Lydia. Well, matter of fact, before I get to Lydia, I'm sorry, that's 16. In Acts 15, we read about the Gentiles and their hearts being cleansed by faith. And again, that was referring back to Cornelius' conversion in Acts chapter 11. In Acts chapter 16, we read about Lydia's heart being opened so that she would understand the things of God. And then the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, verses 18 through 19, prays for his church, prays for the church of Christ, and says, I pray that the Lord would open your hearts, open the eyes of your heart. First and foremost, in our salvation is the Lord's sovereignty and his providential work, in our hearts and our minds. Yes, in a personal, emotional, and feelings-oriented moment. As, I cite, as cited in the Blue Point Bible Church Constitution, water baptism is a solemn and beautiful emblem of the faith that the Lord has deposited within us. Steve is, a, Steve is correct in asserting that baptism is essential for salvation. He offered up quite a few proof texts. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, we read, repent and be baptized. John 3, 5, you read about, which we will, I'm sure, talk about. Uh, John chapter 3, verse 5, you read about the, that a man to be born from above must be born of water and spirit. In Galatians 3.27, that a man must be baptized in Christ, a man baptized into Christ, Colossians 2.12. 1 Corinthians 12.13 talks about being baptized in the spirit. Ephesians 4.4 4 mentions one baptism. What we need to ask ourselves is if Paul's teaching both water baptism and then also baptism by the spirit, which again 1 Corinthians 12.13 says, then what baptism is he asserting that the church at Ephesus needs to be united upon? And everything there in Ephesians 4.4 4 is invisible except for what Steve is proposing as water baptism. In 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21, we read that baptism now saves you. And of course, you read continuing into that text, and it talks about not by the removal of the dirt from the flesh, but rather of a conscience being made clear toward God. Steve, however, however seemingly limits his understanding of baptism. Assuming that all of these mentions that I just said, all of those proof texts, are talking about water baptism. There's a variety of baptism mentioned, mentioned in the scriptures. In the Old Testament, they had a variety of different immersion rituals uh, that they would do, which were baptisms. As a matter of fact, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, points back to the various washings of the Old Covenant. We see that in the holy place, items needed to be baptized by blood, the, the blood of the sacrifice. There's the baptism of Moses. Mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Jesus refers to his death as baptism in Mark chapter 10, verses 37 through 39, as well as Luke chapter 12, verse 50. And then, of course, in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, we read that they were waiting for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The baptism that is essential is the baptism by the Spirit. That was promised and prophesied in the Old Testament, which would cause the people of God to demonstrate the character of Christ. The terms for baptism used in the scripture imply not simply being immersed in a substance, but rather being consumed by a substance. The baptism that matters is the baptism that causes the believer to be consumed by Christ. That affects change, a new creation. Again, I often I appreciate what Elder Steve had mentioned in regards to the way our church studies. We don't always hold to proof texts. Proof texts are great, right? We, we're seeing where the scriptures are sort of lining up and they're synonymous with one another and hopefully we can gain some clear thoughts out of studying scriptures by looking at correlating to other scriptures. However, another great way to understand the things of the Bible is to sort of gain a picture of what's going on. And when you think of baptism, when you think of the true use of the word, 
The, what it's talking about is something being consumed. And the picture I would give you would be how a cucumber becomes a pickle, is it's consumed by the vinegar. Another picture I would give you, and again, these have their place in, in biblical reference, would be the way that a cloth is consumed. A cloth is consumed by the ink. A white cloth, you take a white cloth, you put ink on it, and it is consumed by the ink. As one brother said it, baptism is not something you do. It is something done to you. The salvific baptism in the process of rebirth is initiated by God, one which we have as much to do with as our first birth. Steve is correct in noting that there is water and washing in Scripture. However, I'll just say that uh, maybe we'll lead in on this as we go more into the debate. Uh, I'll say that that is not the holy water, the physical water that is actually filling up our baptismal right back here is not the holy water of scripture that will cleanse you and regenerate you. Also regarding our forgiveness of sins, in Revelation chapter 1 verse 5, it says that we are released of our sins by his blood. We also read in the book of Hebrews that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. That's Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22. The question we need to ask ourselves is how does the blood apply? And I'm going to go ahead and turn to Hebrews chapter 9. I'm going to read to you verses 13 through 14. Can you pass me my Bible back down there? So let's turn over to Hebrews 9. Okay, I said verses 13 and 14. For if the blood of goats and bulls and ashes of a heifer sprinkled those who have been defiled, sanctified for the cleansing of the flesh... How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Again, this blood is supposed to clean your conscience. And again, we'll show probably through this evening where the spirit is that which clears one's conscience, not the water that is in that tub. This is the baptism that's also spoken of in 1 Peter chapter verse 21 where baptism now saves you and again what does it say it says not the removal of the dirt from the flesh old covenant practices but rather the cleaning of one's conscience and again I paraphrase hopefully you see where it correlates beautifully with the contrast that's happening right here in Hebrews chapter 9 you have the old covenant cleansing cleansing of the flesh with the blood of the goats and the bulls and then you have the cleansing that comes through the spirit of God that cleanses your conscience through Christ's blood Christ's sacrifice. Steve is going to try and convince each of you, which he's already done, uh, that you need to choose to be obedient and that the choice of obedience must be displayed as water baptism. So not only does Steve fail to discern the efficient baptism and, as I mentioned, the holy water, but he thinks your salvation has something to do with something you do, contrary to the very clear words. Not of works, lest any man should boast. Ephesians 2.9. And a few other cross-references, if you were to look into that. It's mentioned quite a few places. Because again, the scriptures want to make clear that your faith, that what you have in Christ, is not of you. It's not that you would be able to boast of anything that you have done. It's not just Christ's sacrifice that was a demonstration of his sovereignty and his provident, provident, providential will, but rather his continued election and provision and perseverance on behalf of his people, his will, his good pleasure, and his glory. It's his will and good pleasure that his obedience would be demonstrated through us. It's his particular and effectual call that causes you to be baptized in him. And again, I'm not speaking about water baptism. So again, there's quite a bit that we could go into about election tonight. However, I'm in the negative, so I'm not going to go ahead and go into that. However, I will say that his election his call and his providence and his persevering spirit on behalf of his people, which again I'll be affirming in Michigan, must be understood. You must understand God's spirit given to his people, how his people are called to him, 
and how those people are given a spirit that will cause them to persevere. Some, goal, some goals and agreements, uh, as I begin to close out here, I think I'm getting close to my time. Some goals and agreements tonight would be the importance of scripture. I think Steve and I would both agree that scripture is what we're after tonight. Uh, we see in 1 Timothy 3, 16 through 17, it's the scriptures that are inspired to correct, to rebuke, for the training of uh, righteousness, for the, so that the man might be obedient to the things of God. Uh, then we see proper hermeneutics is also important, and I believe Steve would agree with me in that, uh, in regards to interpretation. There's a proper method of knowing and understanding the details of Scripture. We know in 2 Peter chapter 1 that no prophecy is of private interpretation. I think most of us would agree on cultural context, literary context. Again, as Elder Steve had mentioned there, that we need to uh, understand, you know, we need to read more than 10, 10 verses up and down. Usually we need to read the entire letter as it was written probably to the church there in Corinth or Galatia, etc., and understand a bit about their background. However, I will highlight tonight the problem with proof texting and the benefit of narrative theology. We are to seek, search, study, and prove the things of God. We are to have a reasonable faith. I believe Steve would agree with me on this. We both read our Bibles, and the reason I mention that is because we shouldn't hear a whole lot of, if you read your Bible, because I think we both affirm and we both probably agree that we read our Bibles. I agree with uh, Stephen, that I've, I've heard, seen a lot of these debates where everybody would say things like, if you only read your Bible, well, we're in a Bible church. It's safe to assume most people here read their Bible. Uh, we're, we also believe we're capable opponents. Therefore, we shouldn't hear a whole lot of uh, these things are plainly stated for anyone. The man in the jungle can understand these things. The average man on the street, uh, hopefully, if you know that you need to study these things out, it doesn't really matter what the man on the street uh, would ordinarily think about certain things. We might need to study these things a bit further. One writer said the personal dimensions to the faith must be worked out in relation to the larger narrative. The narrative approach to scripture is good and it doesn't reduce us to selectively choosing scriptures, uh, reducing and distorting the approach of understanding the gospel. And the reason I say all of that is because my very simple answer, and most of those that study know my teachings, I often ask, well, how did Adam find Eden? So again, we have a... Uh, we, I think we would agree on a first century time of transition, uh, so that's why going to the book of Acts should be interesting because we agree that the book of Acts was during a time of transition. There's a lot of conversion going on in there. Obviously, uh, one of the things I'm going to have to do during this debate is show you where those, conver those conversions, I'm sure, don't seem like every one of the conversions that Holger or Steve, uh, either one of them have on an ordinary basis. There's a lot of chosen people going on, a lot of people being sent, and I have yet to read in the book of Acts where somebody was sent to preach the gospel, baptize someone, and that person said, I don't want to be baptized. It's not in the book. Why? So I think Steve and I would both agree that old covenant works don't save. Uh, we both need Christ. Uh, you, you know, again, while I might say that uh, Steve seems to be focusing more on the, uh, the outward work of a believer, the outward proof, if you will, um, I don't agree with that. Uh, and, and Steve and I seemingly would agree on election, as more recently on social media, I had shared a post about God's purpose was to elect some to salvation by grace. God's purpose does not change. And I quoted Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. And Steve responded, no doubt, my friend, that is not in question. So we agree on election. The question is, how is the election conducted? By what means? So again, I appreciate this tonight. I look forward to getting more into a lot of the things that Steve had mentioned. Obviously, we're going to look at the steps of salvation, uh, where one saved. I encourage you to mark those things out as Steve has uh, offered them up. And uh, perfectly, we'll both have a response. I think we agree on that. We need to have a response uh, for our faith. We need to defend the faith. We need to demolish strongholds, arguments that are brought up against the truth of God. And as I demonstrated earlier in this rebuttal, the scriptures highlight a faith that is spiritually discerned. A faith that is opened up by the Lord, a heart that is opened up by the things of God, a faith that is wherein the Lord is the author and perfecter, a faith known when the Lord opens your heart. Furthermore, James tells us, and again, this is where I will conclude, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who provides liberally. James 1.5. No in closing, your salvation, beginning, middle, and end is God's work.
Okay, is it, is it, when is, when is, that, is it up to me to beckon everybody or? <laughs> Let, let me know when we are we still streaming live right now yeah. are we okay are we ready to go or is everybody back in or we're ready to go okay Mario you can uh, start the clock um, I want to apologize Michael I did say that I was going to the Blue Point Baptist Church I I had thought because of your history was Baptist and so I said that and but I apologize for that. You don't want to have that connection. I appreciate that, but your belief is the same as the Baptist, generally speaking, in that faith alone 
uh, baptism has no part of salvation. That's, that is an identical uh, belief of all the Baptists I've encountered. So I apologize for that. You don't want to be called that. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I'll make that correction. If God had asked us to go to Chicago to be saved, I'd go there. I sure would. Does that make Chicago holy? No. Just where he said he's going to save. He said he's going to save us in the water. That's where salvation comes. That's where we're born again and our sins are washed away. And we're going to get into this in a little bit more detail. But Mike says I'm making it more complex than what he believes it is. I don't think there's anyone here that can't understand he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. That's something that all the first century Christians had in common. And Jude 3 says that we're to earnestly contend for the the faith which is once delivered, the common faith which is once delivered. So there's something that every Christian had in common. It was how they became Christians, the plan of salvation. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Not complex at all. Extremely simple. You know, there was somebody who had a problem with that, Nicodemus. Can a man enter again a second time to his mother's womb? That's what I'm talking about. No. Except the man be born of the water and the spirit. And Nicodemus got it. A few verses later. God sold the world and gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him. Right in the same context. Now, Steve said you've got to read 10 verses before, 10 verses after. Right, John 3 16, whosoever believeth should be saved, right? Six verses earlier, except the man be born again. Ten verses later, Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John the Baptist. Well, Jesus baptized not himself. Now, watch this carefully because I'm going to make a powerful argument here. And I really want you to wrap your mind around this, Mike. Open up your heart, brother, friend, buddy. Open your heart up. Jesus made and baptized more disciples than did John, though Jesus himself baptized not. Now, John the Baptist said, Jesus is the one who baptizes you with the Holy Ghost. Only Jesus can do that. I can't baptize anybody with the Holy Spirit. Mike, uh, forgive me, and I know this is sort of, I, I think you're going to be in agreement with me. You can't baptize anybody with the Holy Spirit, can you? Steve, can you baptize anybody? With, that's Jesus' job, isn't it? We agree. Okay. When Ephesians chapter 4 was written, they were still in that first century age. We agree on that. It would end at 70. Ephesians was written in the 60s. Paul writes, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism at that point. Now Jesus, in Matthew 28... He said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and baptize, uh, teach all nations and baptize them. You go teach them and you baptize them. Now he just admitted he can't baptize with the Holy Spirit. I can't. Hoger can't. What's the baptism I can administer? Because Jesus said, you go baptize them. You go baptize them. And you teach those who you baptize to do whatsoever I commanded you always. So when Ephesians 4 was written, what baptism were the disciples administering? It couldn't be Holy Spirit baptism because only Jesus was doing that. But we see Philip baptizing the eunuch with water. We see Peter baptizing people on the day of Pentecost. We see John being washing away his sins. And by the way, that's Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Washed in the blood. Now why tarriest thou arise and wash away thy sins? That's how the washing occurs. It's through baptism. Now, if we are in agreement, and we are, he said, he agrees, there's only one baptism, but which one? It's the one the disciples were administering because Jesus said, you're the one's got to go do it. He can't get around that. He can't get around that. Feeling oriented. He said his salvation is feeling oriented. As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. In Hebrews chapter 8, the Hebrew writer there reiterates what Jeremiah would write in Jeremiah chapter 31. That it must first get into a man's heart and mind before he can become a Christian. 
Now, the old covenant was the exact opposite of that. The old covenant was you were born into the covenant, and then as you grew up, you would learn it. But God said, I'm making a new covenant, not according to my covenant I made with them when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, though I was a husbandman unto them. I'm giving a new one. This time, you've got to get it in your hearts and your minds, and then you're born again. Well, what is it that's got to get in your own hearts and minds? Is it a feeling? If it is, if it's just a feeling, those Muslims who flew into the World Trade Centers had the greatest feeling of salvation this world has ever seen. They felt in their hearts they were on Allah's side. They're going to get their 72 virgins. They're dying for God. They're saved. And they felt this great emotion. Their emotion was so big, they flew jet airplanes into the World Trade Centers. Does that make it true? Now, the idea of getting it into your hearts and your minds before you're born again is the idea of the gospel being taught the gospel, understanding the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Is God powerful? You better believe it. How does he work in the world today? Through his gospel. Uh, the Muslims feel they were saved. I can say they're not. I can say with confidence because I know they weren't Christians. And I can, I can go to the power of God's gospel and I say, you're contradicting what God says. I can prove your feelings aren't working here. I can prove Michael's feelings aren't working here because he says it's Holy Spirit baptism, but Jesus said it's the baptism that the disciples are going to administer, and he agreed with me that he can't administer Holy Spirit baptism. The argument's over. He agreed there's one baptism. I just illustrated and proved it cannot be Holy Spirit baptism. And there's much more that can be said by that. About, and if he presses it, we can get into more details, but that should close the door on it. Now, he uses other passages and he goes to um, well, I got my notes here I'm trying to read down here real quick see where I'm at Revelation 1 5 Acts 22 Hebrews 9 been there been there been there. obedience it's not about obedience it's not about obedience not, well, next chapter 2 verse 38 verse 37 they're pricked in their hearts well what pricked them the gospel Peter just taught the gospel to them they realized they crucified Christ what shall we do they cried out Peter said and said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and your children, to those who are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other signs that he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Acts 2, 37-42. What did they have to do? Save themselves. Peter, the apostle, said, save yourself. Was he baptized with the Holy Ghost when he said that? You better believe it. You better believe it. What did he tell them to do? Save yourselves from this untoward or crooked generation. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, the Hebrew writer wrote there that Jesus Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now watch it carefully. I am not doing away with your heart. I'm not doing away with your emotions. I'm asking you to not do away with the scripture and let your emotions follow the scripture. Don't put your emotions in front of the scripture, feel a certain way, and then demand that the scripture comes with you. Do it the That's what the whole problem with the world is today. They're going by emotionalism. It's emotionally driven. Honey, if it feels good, just do it. And it's killing the nation. It's killing Christianity. It's killing the truth. True Christians will always read God's word, understand it, get it in their hearts, get it in their minds. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And, oh my, I see what he's saying, and, and I feel wonderful about it. And whosoever, <laughs> hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. It's in my heart. I know what he said. I'm doing it. I feel exuberance. I feel wonderful. I'm fantastic. But what if you're not keeping his commandments? He that saith and knoweth him and keepeth not his commandments is the same as a liar, and the truth is not in him. What about keeping the commandment? Doing what Jesus said do. Doing what Jesus said do. So this idea of emotionally driven responses just won't work. It just cannot, cannot work. Paul said, I have called you by my gospel. That's how God calls us today. It's not an emotional tug. It's not a heartfelt string pulling. It's not God doing some whammy zappy with you with, with magic wand. 
the powers in the gospel. And Paul said, I've called you by my gospel. Let's talk about Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9 for a moment. For we're saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. It is a gift of God. Okay? Do you know the Bible speaks of many different kinds of works? Not of works. <laughs> All right, so the Bible says if a man doesn't work, neither should he eat. So if I go to the, and I go out and I work and I provide for my family, I can't turn to God and say, you owe me salvation. That kind of works won't save me. But the Bible says there's the works of the devil. There was, there's a works of man works work to earn a living. The Bible talks about meritorious works, works you can brag about. I helped my little old lady next door mow her yard. I cooked her dinner, and, 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 and I cleaned her house. Now God owes me salvation. That's not going to save you. The disciples asked Jesus in John chapter 6, what kind of works must we, we must do to work the works of God? And you know what Jesus said? Believe, this is the work of God. Even believing is a work. So when he says not of works, lest any man boast, he's not talking about just any arbitrary work. He's talking about being saved under the law of Moses, which is something we have to properly and rightly divide. When we're reading the Bible, and it's talking about the Spirit moving those men during that time, guiding them in the truth, that was before the Bible was written in its completion when they had the miraculous measure of the Spirit, and that's how they were guided with the Spirit. When, but when the Word of God was complete, and when that which is perfect has come, that which is in part shall be done away. 1 Corinthians 13. When the perfect law of liberty, James chapter 2, came, there's no more need for the miraculous because the miraculous was given to confirm the word. Mark 16, 20, Hebrews 2, 1 and 2. So, this being moved by the Spirit idea is in the Bible. Amen, hallelujah, and praise God for it. But it was for a certain people at a certain time for a certain reason that doesn't apply to us because today all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into every good work. Did you get that? The Word of God is what enables us it's what corrects us. It's what gives us instruction that the man of God may be perfect, perfectly furnished into all good things. What gives us that? All scripture. That's how God works today. That's exactly how God works today. So in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, do you know, did you realize that Paul ran into these Ephesians in Acts chapter 19? If you received the Holy Spirit, since you believe, we've not so much heard whether there be any Holy Spirit. Well, what, then he immediately asked them, well, What were you baptized for then? What, what, did you get baptized? Oh, we got baptized under John the Baptist's baptism. <laughs> That's not going to work. That was a different baptism. You're understanding this thing wrong. And Paul took him and baptized the Ephesians a second time, and then he laid his hands on them. That's holy, how the Holy Spirit was imparted in the Bible by the apostles who had the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They imparted the Spirit through the laying on of their hands. And when Simon saw that the Spirit was given by the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and wanted to buy that gift. That's how that thing works. Paul baptized those Ephesians a second time because in water. How do I know that? Because you couldn't baptize them with the Holy Ghost. Only Jesus could do that. You agreed. We're there. We're there. We can, we can go home right now. We can close the doors. We get it. He said there's one baptism. We're, we're there. Paul baptized the Ephesians, the very one you said, the very ones he says who are saved by grace through faith alone. Notice this. He had to add the word alone. Not there in the text. There's a great thing in Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19. I bet you're familiar with it. Any man adds unto the words of the prophecy of this book, so shall the plagues of this book be added unto him. If any man takes away the words of the prophecy of this book, so his name shall be taken away from the Lamb's book of life. Don't add to it. Don't take. So in his proposition written, agreed to debate, he added the word alone. For by grace are we saved through faith alone. James chapter 2 says, not by faith alone. The only time, listen to me carefully, the only time in scripture where the phrase faith alone is used, it says not by faith alone. Abraham was justified by faith. Oh, Acts 2 said he was made righteous by the works. You see now how a man is made, is justified by the works. Not the works of the law of Moses. You see, Abraham was before the law of Moses. 
You're saved by faith. Five minutes here. So, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Let's go back there just again for a moment. These same people who Paul had to baptize a second time because the first one was not valid and they had to have baptism. Michael agrees with me on that. He said so. He agrees with me they couldn't minister Holy Spirit baptism. Paul baptized them. Had to be with water. We agree on that. He had to do it. He's writing to them now. You think they know how they got saved? Oh, yeah. By grace through faith. But how does faith come? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the uh, word of God. Not of works, works of the old covenant law. That wouldn't save them. That's the context there. By faith. By what? The word of God. What did Paul tell them? The word of God. They were baptized? Yeah. And then he reminds them in Ephesians chapter 4, there's one Lord, one faith, one baptism. And then in Ephesians 5, he says it's the washing water. Literally, he said it was the washing of the water. That's what he says. That's what the Bible says. Now, we can go and I can say, passage, he brings up 1 Peter 2, uh, 3.21, excuse me. The Bible there says that eight souls were saved by water during the days of Noah. The like figure whereunto baptism doth also now save us. The same water, the same water that delivered Noah from that old decrepit world and brought him into a new world, into a new place, is the like figure that doth also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh. You know what Peter's saying there? It's not so that you take a bath. It's not that... But it's the answer of a good conscience toward God. Why is it an answer of a good conscience? Why does your conscience feel better when you're baptized with water? Because God said, except a man be born again of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. You know God said that. I know God said that. You know Jesus Christ said, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You know Jesus told his disciples to go out and baptize everybody and then tell them to, to keep doing the same things he told them to do. That's water baptism eternally. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My word shall never pass away. Remember that? It's eternal. What they have to do? Baptize people. Okay. We're getting down to it here, aren't we? I see people going, yeah, and... And it, it's, you know why? It's because it makes sense. The water's not holy, but our Catholic friends do something. They call it the Eucharist. And they say a few words, and they do, give the sign of the cross, and they wave their rosary beads over their communion. And they say that bread literally turns into the physical body of Jesus, and the fruit of the vine turns into the physical body blood of Jesus. That's what they say. That's all they, so they look at the physical so much they make it all physical to the degree that's almost sickening, if you ask me. I think, I think it's pretty sad. Michael does the same thing with water. He looks at it, all he sees is H2O. You know what God said, sees? God sees something he put in his plan for all of eternity that illustrates to the world You've been buried with Christ in baptism and risen to walk in newness of life. Romans 6, verses 3 through 6. And Jesus said this in Matthew chapter 7. You can know them by their fruits, what they do. That makes us fruit inspectors. Okay? How do I know Brother Mario was saved? Watched him get baptized. Well, what happened in that baptism? He was buried into the death of Christ. Was it physical? Was he dead physically? No. How was he dead? Spiritually, the wages of sin is death. He's been, and then he rises to walk out of the watery grave of baptism in newness of life. He's been born again in resurrection. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and life. I can know him by his fruits. How do I know he's born again? He did what Jesus told him to do. He was buried with Christ in his burial and rose to walk in newness of life. Exactly like Christ did. I can't help that we have to have this back and forth. But I can do something with all of my heart, with all of my mind, to illustrate that there is one baptism, that there's one faith, there's one church, and either he's mistaken, and I am misdirecting people, and in great error, or he is mistaken, and I'm going to ask you with all my heart to please think about what we just discussed, because it's monumental. And uh, real quick... Um, how do you know you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit? There's a question. But how, how do you know that? Especially when you agree there's only one. 
He's going to baptize people back here, but there's only one, remember? But you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit if you've been saved, but now we've got two. Thank you. I'm going to start with Philippians chapter 3, verse 9. It just says here, uh, And that we may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. So it, it, it ends the sentence there. So uh, it doesn't say anything else. So for me, again, I'm not in the affirmative. Uh, that would be more that I'll affirm. Uh, when I go to Michigan, where I can affirm that it's by faith alone. I will say that, as he marked out, James 2 uh, brings up that faith by works, and the works that are listed in the book of James are not water baptism. Uh, the, the works there are the works that you had mentioned, the meritorious works of serving the needy and going and doing those things. So, again, that's probably a time for a good exegesis there in James. What are the works? Faith and works. Your, your faith without works is dead. Yes. So, a couple of things that I want to kind of look into here. Uh, the first thing I want to have everybody uh, highlight is that John chapter 6, verse 29 does highlight work. Yes, it says, it is the work of what? Belief is the work of God. So yes, amen. There is a work that is required, and it's the work of God that is required for one to be saved. Uh, what I'd like to highlight is a couple of texts here that seemingly say that. We've all heard Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, which I'm not sure. Are you saying Ephesians 8 through 9 no longer applies? Uh, that would mean that all these other texts that talk about why my grace is not on the basis of something I've done, uh, but rather the work of God, are invalid as well. Romans 11.6 says this, But if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. Titus 3.5, He saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing, notice this, by the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 4, verse 5. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is reckoned to him as righteousness. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was granted in Christ Jesus from all eternity. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his love toward us. We're going to get into that here in a moment. God demonstrates his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then lastly, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16, nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, again here, highlighting the law. However, the, the Greek word egron is not particular. So in all those other places, while yes, the Jews were not justified by the works of law, but you're not justified by anything you've done either. That's the word egron there, the word works, can apply to occupation, it can apply to business, it can apply to something you do, it could apply to works of law, it could apply to a whole bunch of different works. You are not saved by works. Not every one of those texts that I mentioned said you're not saved by the works of law. But notice what they all do mention that it would not be of yourself. That's what we need to take notice of tonight. Our salvation is not of ourselves. Steve said that you save yourself. He highlighted that verse where it says you save yourself. Again, we need to understand what's going on there in Acts chapter 2. They're exhorting a generation that is waiting for the coming of the Lord, and they're telling them, notice what they say, repent and be baptized. I said in my first negative that I'm not against the view that we need to be baptized to be saved. It's obvious from Scripture. The question is, what baptism do we need to undergo? As I mentioned there, Titus chapter 3, verse 5 seemingly points out the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. I wanted to also mark out a text that Steve had brought up in his first affirmative. Steve said that when it, where it says very plainly in the Scriptures that we are under grace, not under law, I'll show you a text, Romans chapter 6, verse 14. It literally says that. We are, not under, we are not under the law, but under grace. So as Steve's marking out saying that, we're, that that's not the case, 
that is the case. Again, I'm going to turn to it. Romans chapter 6, verse 14. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. So again, that isn't what the scriptures say. And I want us to be careful tonight, that we have to be clear that there's some words in scripture, for example, this word baptism, that it can mean a host of more, as I mentioned in my first negative, it can mean a host more than what it might come to the immediate eye. Unfortunately, we've all been taught. And again, I say we've all been taught because Christianity had its precedence with the Catholic Church. And unfortunately, many of us, it still pervades even up to this day, where when we hear the word baptism, we automatically think of that tub there filled with water. We need to remove our minds from that. We need to understand that the scriptures have quite a bit to say about baptism. Again, as I mentioned in my first negative. So that being said, uh, I want to be careful that we, we do not save ourselves and that we are not under the law, but under grace. And again, uh, we're going to get into the commandments. And again, I know that in 1 John, he's very clear on what the commandments of God are. And we're going to see that here in a moment. Steve said that you have to get this in your hearts and minds. The problem with that is this is exactly my point. When you read the beginning of Ephesians, the prayer that I read to you from the Apostle Paul, he doesn't say you have to open your minds and your hearts. He says the Lord will open your heart. So that's what we're getting at here tonight. It's that it's the Lord's doing, not your doing. Open up your heart. Again, that's not our job. It's the Lord that opened Lydia's heart. It's not our job to open our hearts. This is the Lord's doing. Believe and be baptized. Yes, amen. That is in scripture. What I'd like to do, matter of fact, Steve said that in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, he added something there. I'm going to show you. So Steve had mentioned he's reading from the King James Version going to scroll through here. Sure enough, my Bible app won't have the King James Version. <laughs> Let's just make sure. Steve, do you mind if I ask you to read Matthew 28? Sure. Can you read Matthew 28, 19 out of your Bible? Yes. Just open there. I'll read it directly. Thank you. Yes, please. Will you therefore teach all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost? Thank you. So the reason I bring that up is Steve had said, and I'm going to word it the way he said it. He said, go therefore teaching all nations, you baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. No, it doesn't say that. Matter of fact, I looked up, I said, let me find a parallel Bible here and see if any of the translations say that you baptize. Let's read what they say. Start with some translations that I enjoy. The CSB says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Holy Spirit. Uh, let's see uh, the ERV. So go and make followers of all people in the world, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We'll just pick out some randoms here. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'll read from the NASB. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I didn't hear water once, but what I did hear is baptize them in the name of the Father, in the authority of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Nowhere there does it say that you're doing the baptizing. Matter of fact, if we go to the Old Testament, which if I have some time, I'll take us there, we can see who's going to be doing the baptizing. It's the Lord that's going to do a work that's going to cause his people to be obedient. And again, I want to make it clear tonight, I do believe we need to be obedient to the things of God. I believe my life continues to exemplify that. I believe my teachings exemplify that. So I do believe in obedience. I just don't believe that the necessary obedience is that I have to get in the tub a certain way at a certain time under a certain person. I believe my obedience are the things that are very clear in scripture. The fruits of the spirit, the things that make me effective and fruitful in the use of the knowledge of God, the things that I should be clothed with if I'm seen in Christ. The scriptures are clear in these regards. So, again, uh, Steve had mentioned Romans 1.16, and I affirm it is the power of God that causes one to be saved. I was going to go into the plan of salvation. However, I'm going to make this remark. I'll say that the plan of salvation, if you were to uh, get the Spirit and Life Lecture uh, magazine, again, great, great magazine, advertisement here. Uh, you know, again, a good magazine. On the back, they have the plan of salvation. I'd encourage you to search those verse, verses. I have a, a, a effective Christian foundation that I've sort of worked out that I, I don't call it the steps to salvation, but I believe it's the foundation that a Christian must have in his life. 
And I believe that when you go to each verse, if we were to sit here and start proof texting the different verses, you'll notice that, well, it seems like when I believe, I'm, ba- I'm, I'm saved. When I'm baptized, I'm saved. When I'm obedient, I say when I'm saved. When, uh, you know, all these different places. When in reality, it's believe and be baptized. Be immersed in the things of Jesus so that you would be effective and fruitful in the use of the knowledge of God. And again, 2 Peter chapter 1 tells us very clearly what we need to have to see that in our life. So what, the second point I wanted to get to is the commandments. Let's talk about what the commandments of God are. And again, I think we all know that Jesus Christ said, and I'm just going to offer it up, right? Jesus said that uh, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Or, I'm sorry, love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. Again, repeating the Shema from the Old Testament. Love God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. And in doing this, you have fulfilled the law. Jesus' words. So, that being said, now let's go and look at what John says in regards to what fulfilling the commandments of God are. And I'm going to paraphrase and jump around the text a bit. But I'm just going to mention these things so that you might be able to follow. So, let's start at 1 John chapter 1. And herein we read, and by this we know that we have come to know him. This is 1 John chapter uh, 2, verse 3. If we keep his commandments. Now, if you go down to verse 6, it says, The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner that he walked. Verse 9, well, we're not going to go to verse 19, but there is an interesting thing there in uh, chapter, uh, verse 19 of chapter, yes, chapter 2, and also verse 20. Uh, you see a contrast. There was a group of people that were with them that are not of them anymore, and that was to show, I underlined show in my Bible, there was something being shown through that picture, but then the contrast is, but you have the anointing from the Holy One, and you all know it. And then you continue into 1 John chapter 3, and notice this, the love that we have, right, I'm going to show you this here in a moment, but we love God because he loved us, I mentioned that in Romans. It says here, a love that the Father has bestowed on us, So the love that we have is a love that the Father has given us. I love God because he's loved me. Matter of fact, if you go to 1 John chapter, well, let's stay in chapter 3, verse 14, notice this. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. Because we love the brethren. That's the commandment, love the brethren. And I'll show you as you continue through the book. You go into chapter 4. And it notices, again, John's repeating some very simple points here, and I would encourage you to read through the epistle of John, 1 John. But in verse 9, he says this, By this, the love of God was manifested in us. Something being manifest in you means it was given to you and it's being provoked through you. Now notice this, verse 10. In this is love, not that we loved God, not that we loved God and obeyed his commandments, but rather, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Verse 19. We love Again, it seems like John's trying to make something very clear here in this letter. That if we love the brethren, if we love God, that is obeying his commandments. We love because he first loved us. Don't think you love him because it's of your own effort. Again, that's something that's made known again and again throughout the scriptures. Verse 21, notice this. And this is the commandment. So if we're wondering what what are the commandments that I need to follow that John's saying, that if I love Christ, I'll follow his commandments. And this is the commandment we have heard from him, that the one who loves God should also love his brother. And then you get to 1 John chapter 5. We're at the end of the letter here. He's already explained to us what he meant at the beginning, what the commandment of God is, that we love one another. Here we end. Whoever believes that Jesus is is the Christ is born of God, is born of God. goes back to that birth I mentioned that you had nothing to do with. By this we know that we love the children of God. So now, how do we know we love God? We love the brethren. How do we know we love the children of God? When we love God and observe his commandments, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome. They're not telling a man that's walking in the effective and fruitful things of God that you need to get into a tub to call yourself saved. That's burdensome. It's burdensome. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. His commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. Notice what overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith. So it does say faith alone. What is the victory that has overcome the world? Our faith. The faith that is demonstrated through me because I love God. I love God by loving the brethren. So again, the commandment of God is very clear. The commandment of God according to the gospel of John, or the epistle of John for that matter, is not that you need to be water baptized. 
want to continue into John chapter 3, verse 5, because again, obviously, it kind of seems to follow suit here. John 3, verse 5, he says that you must be born of water and spirit. Now, without taking you throughout the entire Old Testament of the prophecies and promises, Ezekiel 11, Ezekiel 36, Jeremiah 31, all throughout the Old Testament, there was this promise of this water that would refresh the people of God. David cried out in Psalm 51, Lord, wash me, clean me from sin. I don't believe he was talking about that water right there. That tub wasn't even filled. But again, let's, let's consider, let's go to John 3, 5. We're just going to start there for a moment. Jesus answered, truly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, Steve, I agree with you that that water mentioned there is not the, the yeah, there you go, fancy words. Uh, again, not a doctor. Um, but I agree with that. that it, it doesn't work for me. However, so I sit here and I wonder and I ponder the text and I say, what water is he speaking about? Again, I am familiar with the Old Testament and I know the water of promise in the Old Testament. It was the Holy Spirit. But however, let's see if that works with just a simple reading through the book of John. So then we go from John chapter 3, verse 5. We move into John chapter 4 and we find Jesus talking to this woman at the well. And he tells her, most of us know this story, he asks her for water, woman. Uh, the Samaritan woman, therefore, said, he asked her for water. She says, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink? I am a Samaritan woman, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus asked her, answered her and said, if you knew the gift of God, if you knew the gift of God, and who it is that says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. She said, sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where do you get this living water? You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself, his sons and his cattle? Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water shall thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. The woman said, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty, uh, nor that I will have to come here. And again, we see that this woman ends up receiving the faith. Through Christ here, uh, she says, uh, the woman said to him, sir, I perceive, perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped in this mountain. People say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And again, I think we all know the rest of that story. Jesus urges her to, uh, that those who worship the Father must worship him in spirit and in truth. And then she notices that he's the Messiah and she leaves. He never water baptized her, but again, I, I'm sure there's an argument to that. But Jesus never water baptized her before she went into the town and began to offer up her testimony. So that's the water there. Now let's just continue a bit further. Uh, matter of fact, John chapter 5, there's a man sitting at a well, uh, sitting at a, you know, this pool, uh, waiting for healing. What was the whole point of John chapter 5? To show that the water of that healing pool did not work, but the Spirit of God would heal. Then you move a bit further. You go into John chapter 6. Matter of fact, I'm sorry, if you, yeah, if you go into John chapter 6, you end up reading here about a water that will flow out of the belly of the believers. That's what I get for not pulling my notes out. But again, so there's water all throughout the Gospel of John. I would encourage you, you want to know what water John is talking about in John 3, 5, just simply read John chapters 3 through 7 and ask yourself, what water does Jesus give? As I had said in one of our conversations here preparing for this debate, I'd rather be baptized by the water that Jesus gives than the water that Steve gives. Again, that's the water that I'm concerned with, is the holy water, the washing, that was mentioned by John all throughout this text, and also, as I had mentioned before, Titus 3, 5, but according to his mercy, by the washing and regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Again, I would encourage you, and maybe I'll have to come back up here and prove my point, uh, all throughout the Old Testament, this was a promise. And matter of fact, when that Holy Spirit, that spiritual water, if you will, was poured out upon believers, guess what it would cause them to do if you read Ezekiel chapter 36? It would cause them to obey. That's why I obey the things of God. It is not of myself. It is God's work in and through me and being shown for his glory and his purpose.
that's easy. We can do that. <laughs> Amen. Amen. All right. Let's uh, let give you, I, I believe this is yours, right? Mario, you want to start my time, buddy? Go ahead. Every passage cited, that he cited, dealing with works, didn't save you by works, is talking about the works of the law in contrast to the gospel, to faith, Jesus Christ. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That's what was saving. It was impossible for the old law to save anyone. You couldn't be saved through those works of the old law. In the New Testament, we have to rightly divide. When, he, when, when, when the audience is primarily Jewish, and Paul's discussing with them, and he's telling them, you know, not one job or two, the law shall cease to all be fulfilled. The law was still there. And he's telling them, look, this, is, this won't save you. The works of the law won't do it. It can't do it. We're justified by faith, like Abraham was. Now, when Abraham was justified by, by faith, the, the passage explicitly states it was in his doing something when he offered up Isaac, his son. He did a lot of preparation for that. He traveled to that. He went there, and he was right about it. And God stopped him right at the, he was. He had done all that. He, had, he even had his son Isaac carrying the wood for fire for the, for the sacrifice. He, you sure? And, 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 and we do know that he was justified by works. What works? Not the works of the law of Moses. It, it didn't even exist then. But by faith. Faith come by hearing, hearing by word, the word of God. God told him what to do, so he did it. While sinners, Michael said, Christ died for us, and that's just universal. Okay, let's go home. You don't need the Bible. You don't need grace. You don't need God. You don't need anything. Why? Christ died for sinners. That's it. That's, that's implied in his message. If, if, if that's just what it is, that Christ did it all for us, and there's nothing we can do, there's no distinction between the atheist, the unbeliever, the Muslim flying into the World Trade Centers, or true Christians, or fake Christians. How do I know when somebody's being fake? <laughs> Anybody says, I know him and doesn't keep his commandments, the same as a liar, and the truth is not in him. That's how I know when somebody's not being real. I can determine it through the Word of God, which is faith. Now, what is happening here, folks? I want you to watch this carefully, okay? What Mike is doing is causing a lot of contradiction in the scriptures. Now they say they need context, and Steve, I appreciate what you said. Usually when somebody wants to cite a verse, we'll have them read 10 verses before, 10 verses after to get the context. I, I agree with that, but that's immediate context, okay? There's something called remote context. Both must be respected. Paul has to agree with Moses. They're not contradicting each other. John has to agree with Isaiah. Peter has to agree with James. Mark has to. That, the whole context of the whole Bible. So, I cited a passage from the Apostle Peter. Save yourselves. He said, there's nothing we can do. We can't save ourselves. Peter would beg to differ. Peter literally said, save yourselves from this crooked generation. He says, we can't do it. Jesus did it all for us. Wait a minute. He cites a passage where he died for sinners and Jesus did it for us. I don't disagree with that. But in order to determine who it is, somebody got to respond to the message. Every time, every single time in the Bible, you find somebody being called faithful. Every time without exception. Mike, write this down. Every time without exception. Go to the book of faith, Hebrews chapter 11. That's what it's referred to as the book because all these people were saved by faith, right? Every time without exception, God speaks, man hears, and man obeys. Every single solitary time. The walls of Jericho fell by faith after they were compassed about seven days. Not before. Not before. Not before. God is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Now let's go to Romans chapter 6 verse 3 because I want to get this. I'm trying to go slow, but at the same time there's so much I want to share with you. In Romans chapter... 6 verse 3 I want to begin there if I can uh, flip my Bible open <clears throat> because he brought up Romans 6 14 talking about the law again all right let, let's let's investigate this let's see exactly what the Bible says about it Romans 6 3 know you not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death 
Okay, baptism is definitely... And by the way, real quick, just real quick. Didn't Paul baptize the Ephesians? No. Didn't Peter baptize those on Pentecost? No. Didn't Philip baptize the eunuch and the Samaritans and Simon the sorcerer? See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? They were baptizing where there was much water. Jesus was baptized in the river Jordan. The like figure one, two, water doth also now save us. Yes, 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 yes. There are three that bear witness in the earth. The water, the spirit, and the blood. And these three agree in one. First John chapter 5, 8. You need the water as a, as a witness, not H2O. God said that's where he's going to save you. Let's respect that. So Paul, by the way, is teaching one baptism. He wrote it. Know ye not that as many of us as were baptized, and he was washed, his sins were washed away, when he obeyed, and that's why Ananias had to go to him, a gospel preacher had to baptize him. The power's not in me, the power's in the gospel. What you understand, between you and God, but you've got to be obedient to it, save yourselves. Ananias went and taught him, why, ta why tarest thou? Rise and be baptized. He's never touched that, never touched it. But let, let, let's stay in Romans 6. I don't want to get too far off here, okay? Verse 4, therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ is raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Isn't that beautiful? There's your new birth. When? When you're baptized. What happened? You're buried in the watery grave of baptism. Now, wait a minute. Hang on. Before I get too far on, I've got to make this point, okay? He's got water warming up back here in case anybody wants to be baptized as if it's optional. It's not optional. You must be born again or you're not saved. You're not my brother in Christ until you've been baptized into the family of God. I'm sorry, that's the truth. Except to be born again of the water and spirit, you cannot go to heaven. You're not God's family. Okay, he's got water heating up back here. But he says, you're saved by Holy Spirit baptism. The Bible says there's only one. He's going to do it a second time, isn't he? Now, wait a minute. Let's think about this. If you're already alive in Christ, you're living, you come back to life, you've been born again, praise God, hallelujah. Why are you going to bury a living person in baptism? We don't bury living people where I come from. That's a crime. We bury the dead. I'm sorry. don't mean to get so worked up. Let's keep reading. Romans chapter 6, verse 5. For if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in, the, in resurrection, literally, in resurrection life. When? When we're baptized. Okay. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Where did that happen at? Being planted together in what? Baptism? Paul's preaching one baptism. What is it? One he was subject to. The one Ananias went to him with. The one Philip was doing. The one Peter was doing. The one Jesus was doing. His disciples. All the same, the exact same one where there was much water. Okay. By the way, Peter told Cornelius, he commanded him to be baptized. He said, can any man forbid water that these should be baptized like we as in the beginning? Can any man do what? Forbid water? He commanded them to be baptized? Acts 10, 47, we're going to get to that, uh, Lord willing, uh, in, in tomorrow's uh, uh, affirmative. But let's keep reading from Romans 6, okay? I want to get to this. Knowing that Christ, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over us, over him, excuse me. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus our Lord. Who? Those who were baptized. Why? They buried the body of sin. They rose to walk a new life. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Something you've got to do. Keep that in mind, okay? Because we're going to get there real quick. But yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Under the old law. He's talking to those here who knew the law. Romans chapter 7 verse 1. In fact, all through, from Romans 2 through, through chapter 9, he's making the distinction to the Jewish Christians at the church of Rome that just because they were uh, under the law of Moses, they were not superior to the Gentile. And he's talking them about the law of Moses. That's what he's talking about. In context, you're dead to the law of Moses here. That's the context. Context, context, context. Let's go back 10 verses. Okay, doing what? Having obeyed 
baptism? Yeah, yeah. No, you're not. As many of us are baptized into Jesus, we're baptized into his death. Yep, yeah, okay. Let's get to context. All the way back to Romans 2, he's saying, you Jews have no superiority over the Gentiles. You're sinners too, and you're not under that law. But now watch it. Let me prove it. Look at verse 15. What then? Shall we sin? Because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Now write this down, Mike, please. Two verses after the one you cited. Verse 16. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey? All, oh, nothing we do. We don't got to do a thing. His servants you are to whom you obey, whether of, uh, uh, of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. That's how Abraham was made righteous. He obeyed. He did what God said. But now watch it. But God be thanked that you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you, being then... Being th There's your time statement. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness. When? When you obeyed from your heart, being baptized of the water and the spirit, your spirit, your heart, that form of doctrine which was delivered. What form of doctrine was delivered then? No, you're not that many of us were baptized into Jesus, were baptized into his death, we rose to walk in newness of life. That's the context. That's what he's getting into. Not, not a baptism that we obey. It's not something we do. Save yourselves. They obeyed from their heart. This is what the Bible teaches. He's contradicting. He got up and he says, Steve said, Matthew 28 says, verse 19, had me read it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptize them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And I answered the word you there. You know why? For emphasis. For emphasis, that Jesus is talking to them. He's telling them, this is what you've got to do. You go teach them, and you baptize them. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations, and baptize them. That's what he told them. And then he read several other versions that said the exact same thing. Go make disciples and baptize them. Who's he talking to there? Philip was doing it. Peter was doing it. John was doing it. Paul was doing it. Doing what? Baptizing in water. See, here's water. What would hinder me to be baptized? The eunuch said it in Acts 8. That's the baptism of Paul. He said there's only one baptism. Okay. All right. Let's deal with this thing here. The Lord opened Lydia's heart. Isn't that wonderful? Let me give you an illustration of something real quick. <clears throat> the sun comes up in the summer. And it gets nice and warm. Love beautiful sunny days. I know we all do. It's wonderful. But let's do an experiment for just a moment. Let's take a piece of clay... And let's take a piece of butter and let's put them both in that sun. That sun will melt one and harden the other. The word of God, the word of God is what melts your heart or what hardens it. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. The Bible says both. How's that true? Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Because God told him what to do and he didn't like it and it hardened his heart. But when God tells you what to do and you love God, oh, you melt. And God opens your heart that way. And that's why I wrote, yes, it's not that God does this. It's how does God do this? Through his power. What is his power? The gospel of Jesus Christ. What, that's how God works in our lives today. Is your heart hardening right now or is your heart melting right now? The word of God should be permeating your, upon your hearts right now. Are you softening it to God's word? Or are you getting mad about it because this guy is up here telling me Holy Spirit baptism doesn't happen anymore? Because Paul said there's one, and I can illustrate and have illustrated more than amply, and he can say, the Bible says that we don't save ourselves and, and pull up all these passages, but he's contradicting other passages that clearly says obey, 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 save yourselves, save yourselves, save yourselves. Not he that heareth, but he that doeth. If you love me and keep my commandments, my Father and I will love you. He said, love is the work of God. Well, amen. If you love me and keep my commandments, my Father and I will love you. I read that at the beginning. He acts as if I didn't say anything. Right there in the same passage as in 1 John chapter 2, verse 29. Any man that doeth righteousness is born of God. He said you can't be birthed of yourself. God begs to differ, Michael. God says you've got to do righteousness. I explained what righteousness is and how it comes. It's all the commandments of God. Did God command them to be baptized? You better believe it. How do you know? He said it. He commanded them to be baptized. Acts 10, 47. 
Baptism does also not save us, except the man be born again, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We can continue to illustrate how these things happen, but if your heart's hardened, Thor couldn't pound it in there with his magic hammer, and Jesus couldn't pound it in even though he walked on water, you will still resist it. You will still resist it. And it's here, and it's plain, and I don't think it's complicated for those who are truly seeking. Seek you first, the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to Oh, don't seek. Can't do any seeking. Why? Because God did it all for you, and, and you don't have to do that. No. Something we've got to do. This do-nothing gospel is killing not only Christianity. It's killing our nation because it's permeated into the hearts and the minds of the people of the United States of America. I'm not going to get into politics, but our whole nation is based upon this emotionalism of we don't have to do a thing, and the government owes us everything. Where did you get that idea from, you think? This kind of stuff I'm debating right now. There, didn't Jesus say, I'm going to reward every man according to his what? His works? Not of works, lest any man should boast. What kind of works? Works of the law, of Moses. I told him, there, listen, the Bible says there are many kind of works. Works of God. He said that. Not of works. Not of works of God. Does God save us, Mike? Define the works there. And then you'll get your answer. Okay? Let's get on. Let's, let's get down to this. And by the way, the Bible, I stopped counting at 28 things. The Bible says 28 different things at least saves us. Oh, God saves us. The Spirit saves us. Jesus saves us. The blood saves us. The word saves us. The gospel saves us. Belief saves us. Repentance saves us. Confession saves us. Baptism doth also not save us. Which one? The one that the disciples were administering, not Jesus Christ. That's which one. There's no way around that. No way around that. Now, let's keep on going. Birth, you know, uh, okay, got that. He said we must love him. Let's, let, if you would, if you would, please, let's turn to Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Mark chapter 1, verse 4. Because John the Baptist began preaching Christ and the kingdom of heaven was that near, it was near. And in, John, and in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, the Bible says, John did baptize in the wilderness and preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. What baptism was John doing? Michael's in agreement with me. It wasn't Holy Spirit baptism. John the Baptist said, huh? Jesus is the only one baptized with the Holy Spirit. He's going to baptize you with Holy Spirit fire. Matthew chapter 3. John's baptizing in the river Jordan. Jesus submitted unto that baptism. The Bible says that the Pharisees and the scribes rejected the counsel of God being not baptized with John. What did they do? Rejected the counsel of God being not baptized with John. What was it for? Remission of sins. Remission of sin. Now, I began this and for a reason, saying that sin comes in two ways. It's the sin of omission and the sin of commission. And I have a rhetorical question, and this is going to sound funny for just a moment. If the Pharisees and the scribes were condemned for not following the counsel of God and being baptized at John's baptism, and they were, did Jesus have to do it if it was the counsel of God? John asked him that question. I have need to be baptized. Well, why do you come here? Why do you want me to baptize you? Suffer to be so for now. For thus is for us to fulfill all righteousness. To do what? How's righteousness come? The commands of God. God commanded him to be baptized. What if Jesus rejected? Somebody says, well, he's without sin. Amen. But a part of that is because he followed all the counsel of God. He didn't fight against it. He didn't start arguing with John and say, listen, John, what are you doing down here in the water? Listen, you think, you think John the Baptist and Jesus knew about the book of Ezekiel and, and the passages about being washed with water? Absolutely. Do you think in your hearts and in your minds for one minute there's a spiritual application to things we do physically? Can't we know someone by their fruits? If you think it's all spiritual, why do you meet here Sundays? Why do you give your money? Why do you take the communion? Why do you preach? Why do you, why do you live in accordance to righteousness? Why do you do anything if it's all spiritual? And God did it all for you on top of that. Now, real quick, 
Saved by grace through faith alone. Now, I am not a really highly educated person. I barely made it through high school, as a matter of fact. But the last time I counted, we're saved by grace, number one, through faith alone. Wait a minute. One plus one equals what? Thank you. Two. Grace, we're saved by grace through faith alone? Two things that right there <clears throat> won't work. Thank you. Are we going to take five minutes, ten minutes now, or you want to have your final rebuttal? find a lot of this pretty troubling. Um, the first thing would say, uh, I would assert is I, I don't believe in a do-nothing gospel. Uh, again, uh, if we're in the spirit, so we should walk in the spirit. Uh, so again, I, I don't believe in a do-nothing gospel. I believe in a persevering faith. I believe that if God gives you faith, he, it will persevere. I find it troubling. One of, the, one of the sentences that Steve had said was that you want you want the baptism that was done by the disciples, not the baptism that is done by Christ? I want the ba baptism that's done by Christ. And, uh, you know, again, he mentioned every text that talks about works, right? All these texts. Again, James 2. I, I bring us back to James 2. Uh, James 2 talks about works. Faith without works is dead. And it tells you in the book of James the works that you need to have on top of your faith. And that's the works of service toward others. Again, read James 2. doesn't say water baptism in James 2. Uh, and then I want to sort of reverse this. Uh, so it's not of works, and Steve's saying that that's works of law, lest you would boast in yourselves. You are saved by grace, not by works, so that you would not boast in and of yourselves. So what Steve's saying is, well, no, that's talking about people that were under the works of the law, that they're not saved by the works of law. So then let's look at that and let's reverse that. So it's okay, you were saved by works, and it is of yourselves. That's troubling to me. That's what the reverse of that would be. If we rip that verse out, if you take two, uh, Ephesians 2, 8 through 9 out of a believer's hands, where it says that you are saved by grace, not of works, so that you should not boast in and of something that comes of yourself, if we were to take that away, and we were to say, oh, well, no, that was talking about the works of the law. So, Mike, you are saved by your works, so that you can boast in and of yourself. That's troubling. It should trouble us. Again, I, you know, in the book of Acts, I'm just going to say this, you know, and I know there's this chart that's often brought up by uh, a lot of people that use the book of Acts for conversion uh, stuff. You know, you, you see here, uh, this is a chart that's used in often debates, so, you know, teaching, believing, confessing, repenting, baptizing, and obviously the point is that all of them have people being baptized. However, if you were to do the research and you read through the book of Acts, look up the word chosen. And see how many times you find the word chosen all throughout the book of Acts. Almost every one of those conversions talk about people being chosen. And again, as I mentioned in my first negative, that every time those people are chosen and someone is sent to preach the gospel to them, and yes, I do believe water baptism has its place in the book of Acts. Again, there was a transition period happening. They were saving themselves from that untoward generation, which again, I don't believe anybody here is doing. I don't believe Steve thinks that you're saving yourselves toward that untoward generation. I know you don't. So... Again, I would make the argument that what we're seeing in the book of Acts is, yes, water baptism had a place. It clearly had a place in the Old Testament. That's why Jesus was baptized of John. Like here, it clearly had a place with those that were living under law, living in a certain transitional time as a demonstration of their faith. You know what else you read in the book of Acts? You read about a group of people that take all the books that they were using in their worship and they bring them to the disciples and burn them. We don't encourage that in the church today. Bring all your stuff, all your junk. That would be a scary day at church. Uh, and let's all burn it all up. So again, there's a lot of elements in the book of Acts that we don't see happening in everyday conversions. We don't see people being chosen, people being sent again. You know, you see with uh, Philip and the eunuch, right? Philip is taken by the Spirit and brought to where the eunuch is. The eunuch's reading the Bible, right? reading the scriptures, reading Isaiah. Uh, and then he reads Isaiah, and then Philip comes up to him. Is this the conversion experience that Steve's having in all of his moments? I'd be very interested to hear that. Are all the elements that are there in the book of Acts there 
when you're seeing moments of conversion. If we're going to place emphasis on water baptism. Again, I said in my opening negative that I don't want to make things bigger than they are. And I charge that Steve makes water baptism bigger than it is. We do see, again, I, I want to make clear, we do see water baptism in Scripture. I want to bring us over to Matthew chapter 20, verses 29 through 34. And they were going from Jericho, a great multitude followed, two men sitting on the road, hearing as they were passing by, uh, hearing that Jesus was passing by, cried out saying, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And the multitude sternly told them to be quiet, but they cried out all the more saying, Lord David, have mercy on us. Uh, I'm sorry, Lord, mercy, son of David, uh, have mercy on us, son of David. And Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do? They said, Lord, we want our eyes to be opened. And moved with compassion, Jesus touched their eyes, and immediately they regained their sight and began to follow him. Do you see the order of salvation there? The Lord opened their eyes, they follow him. That's again, that's another conversion experience that we see in scripture. That's actually what we see Jesus doing. So what is going on in Acts? We need to admit that there's a particular situation happening in the book of Acts. To be baptized, let's be clear, to be baptized in the name of something is a sign of identifying with that name, taking on the character, as well as a commitment. A commitment, it's not just a one-time thing. It's something that uh, the baptism in the name, in the authority of Jesus, is something that continues in your life as you persevere in Christ. Baptism in the, in the Old Testament and, and, also, and in the first century was the means of making a decision public. Those who refused to be baptized were saying they did not truly believe. So in the minds of the apostles and the early disciples, the idea of an unbaptized, unwater baptized believer was unheard of. When a person claimed to be in Christ, yet was, uh, was ashamed to proclaim his faith in public, it indicated that he did not have true faith. Just like we see with the Ephesians when they bring their books of worship and they burn them. It was the same point. It was, I'm rejecting my old lifestyle and I'm putting my faith in this new lifestyle. We're not asking people to bring their stuff to church so that we could burn them. We're not asking people, and again, you see this in, in Jesus's, uh, in the Gospels. You see where many people get confused by that story of the demoniac and, and the, the, the spirit of the demon going into the pigs. Again, it's the same thing that was happening in Ephesus where they were destroying their, the things that they were worshiping and moving away from that. It was a very popular ancient Near Eastern practice. Just like this water baptism is being demonstrated throughout the book of Acts. It was a very popular thing for that time. My question is, can water mean something else? And I also demonstrated to you in my second negative where water from John 3, 3, 5, we talked about being water, born of the water and spirit, and then we followed through. And in the Greek, there's this interesting thing, well, in the Hebrew, the Hebrew uh, parallelisms where they repeat phrases to add importance. We see Jesus do it often. Truly, truly, I tell you. I would make the case that that's what you're seeing in John 3, 5. We're seeing a, a, a parallelism where it's placing emphasis upon what a man must do. He must, to be born from above, you must be born of the Spirit. And that's why Jesus explains the water in John chapter 4, John chapter 6, 7, etc. You see it constantly being pointed. That is the water. Can the water mean something else? Oftentimes, Elder Steve will say things like, what is greater, the altar or the offering that sanctifies it? So again, we have to ask ourselves, what is the water? Can water mean something else? Bring together some of my notes. Matter of fact, you know what I'll do? I want to bring us in on what causes us to be obedient. Because Steve talked about being obedient, that we need to be obedient. And I want to challenge what causes us to be obedient. Ezekiel chapter 11. Because I believe in obedience. Ezekiel 11, verses 19 through 20. And I shall give them one heart and shall put a new spirit within them, and I will take the heart of stone out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. What will cause them to do it? The spirit he gives them. The spirit will cause them to be obedient to the things of God. Let's look at Isaiah chapter, well, matter of fact, since we're in Ezekiel, uh, we'll look at Ezekiel 36. Ezekiel chapter 36, verses 26 through 27. Moreover, again, same point. 
Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and will give you. Again, there's, notice these words. He'll give you. He'll put. He'll do this. God will do these things. Perfectly, we all agree on who the he is that's doing these things. And I will put my spirit. Notice this, verse 27. And I will put my spirit within you and will cause you to walk in my statutes, that you will be careful to observe my statutes. So what causes you to be obedient? The spirit of God. In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 3. For I will pour out water on the thirsty land and on the streams, uh, and on streams on dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing upon your descendants, and they will spring up among the grass like poplars by streams of water. Notice the water there. What's the water? Can the water mean something else? What's the water that causes you to obey? It's the spirit of God. Let's look a bit further. Isaiah 59, verse 21. And as for me, this is my covenant with them, says the Lord. My spirit which is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from the mouth of your offspring, nor from the mouth of your offspring's offspring, offspring, says the Lord, from now and forever. He will pour out a spirit that will cause his people to be obedient. Again, these are Old Testament texts, and there's, there's plenty in the New Testament. You can look at Romans 8, where it talks about, matter of fact, let's go ahead and look at Romans 8. Since I gave you Old Testament text, I think it's right to give you some New Testament text to show you what is causing the saint's obedience, that the saint might not boast in and of themselves. In Romans 8, verses 13 through 14. For if you living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body. How do you put to death the deeds of the body? By the spirit. By the spirit you're putting to death the deeds of the body. You will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. We're talking a lot about being born of God. Well, how do we know somebody's born of God? They're born of the Spirit. How do we know they're born of the Spirit? They demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit. They have a persevering Spirit that continues to demonstrate those fruits. Jesus said, if you remain in me, you will produce fruit. That will remain. How do you believe in him? By the Spirit that causes you to believe. The Spirit that causes you to obey. So again, I do believe in obedience. I just don't believe in an obedience that I would boast in it, but rather an obedience that comes to me by the Spirit of God. And again, that would be my major point. Again, the point is, is that we're, we're talking about tonight how the Lord has made his people obedient so that we would demonstrate fruit. Matter of fact, I have one last point I want to make. Why do we say that it's not of works, lest we would boast? Because pride can pop up, and we can seem like we have the outside of the cup clean and not the inside. Remember when Jesus said that? These people have the outside of the cup, meaning I can see that they're, yeah, they're doing things that you can see and you think they're righteous. But those people are far from him. Those people are not. He says, wash the inside of the cup. Wash it with what? The water of the Spirit. Not that water. It's not going to wash the inside, the heart that needs to be righteous. I wrote a bunch of texts here. You know, my, my, one of my points would be this. Your position is too outwardly dependent. You don't need to know if I'm in Christ. You know how I'll show you? I'll love the brethren. Just like John told me, I'll obey his commandment, and I will love the brethren. You don't need to know all these outward signs. Of, again, that's the whole point. The Pharisees had all those outward signs. They had the outside of the cup clean. Jesus said, remember where he said a bit further? He said, on that day, many will come to me and say, but well, we did this in your name, we did that in your name, we did all these things in your name outwardly. And what did Jesus say to them? I don't know you. It's your heart that needs to be right with God. You need to have a spirit that will cause you to obey so that you will not boast in and of yourself. Matter of fact, the book of Romans goes on to say, I didn't write the text here, but it says it in scripture, to his own master he stands and falls. And I will say the same thing. To my own master I stand and fall. Unsearchable in the book of Romans. It says unsearchable are his judgments. You're trying to make a judgment that's not yours to judge on. Unsearchable are his judgments. I heard one preacher talk about how water baptism could be the unifying factor for the church. If we would all just agree about water baptism... 
Because we get all the other elements in Ephesians 4, right? All the unseen things. We seem to understand the church, the faith, the Father, the Lord. But then we get to this baptism thing, and all of a sudden we divide. Well, I'd say yes, that baptism can be that which unifies the church. But it's the baptism into Jesus that causes a change. That water does not cause the change that God is looking for in believers. I would urge, rather, be baptized in Christ. Possess and increase in the things that make you effective and fruitful in the use of the knowledge of God. And if you do that, matter of fact, if you'd like to turn with me to 2 Peter 1, notice what 2 Peter 1 says. I'm going to start at verse 3. Matter of fact, let's start at verse 2. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called on us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us, to us his precious and magnificent promises, in order that by them you might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now for this very reason, what very reason? That you know the knowledge that led to the promises. Now for this very reason, apply all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. Because love fulfills. That's why it's mentioned last. For if these qualities, notice this, for if these qualities are yours and are increasing, it sounds a lot like that when I defined baptism for you a bit earlier. If something goes into a substance and it's consumed by it so that it becomes a new creation. If these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification. Notice this, his purification from his former sins. Now this is a text I hold to right here, and I'll end on this point. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent, because I like diligence. I believe I'm called to diligence in Christ. Be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, which that's what we're talking about here. I'm trying to figure out, did he call and choose me or not? I'm being told I need to get into a tub. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. For in this way, the entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior will be abundantly supplied to you. I take God at his word there. I believe that if I possess an increase in these things, if I'm baptized in Jesus Christ, I'm obedient to him because he did a work in me so that I would not boast in and of myself, for it is by grace that you have been saved, not in of yourselves. And again, what gives us the victory? Our faith, as we pointed out before in John. Thank you. What are we, early? How's that? That's not possible. I thought you said miracles. Miracles. You're the first to raise your hand that I saw. I, I'm sorry I didn't get your name. Uh, Brian. Hi, Brian. Nice to meet you. Nice. Thank you. Call me whatever you like. I'm, I'm good with almost anything. Just yeah, that's right. I, as you can see, I'm never late for dinner. <laughs> Very rare. I'm sorry. Yeah, right.
Thank you for your good heart, Brian. I appreciate it. Let me let me let me respond. Uh, keep your thoughts in your in your in your minds. In Acts chapter eight, the Lord sent Philip to talk to the eunuch, the Ethiopian eunuch. He had been to Jerusalem to worship. He's going back to Ethiopia, and so Philip comes, and the Bible says he preached unto him Jesus. And the very next verse, the eunuch responds. The very next verse, the eunuch responds. See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Preaching Jesus is preaching baptism, water baptism. See, here it is. What would stop me? Now, here's what, here's what Philip responded with. If thou believest, thou mayest. So there's a prerequisition. It's got to be in your heart first, okay? Man must be born again of the water and the spirit. Yet, and yet you have to believe with all of your heart. If you believe with all of your heart, you may. Now, the Catholics take babies who do not yet have it in their heart, and they sprinkle them or they pour them. I've seen some actually fully immersed, and they call it a baptism. But the Bible says you must first believe or you can't. Peter said it this way. Repent and be baptized. Repentance precedes baptism. Jesus said, believe and be baptized. And little babies can't. Now, my Catholic friends, my wife was a Catholic. I have many Catholic friends. I, I, I love them too. But what they're doing is they're, they see the relevance of water baptism. They see what you see right now. And they say, we got to do it. But now, wait a minute. To whom, when, where, how, and why are all things we must understand and the Bible gives us those explanations. So you take a true believer that's repentant of his sins, and you baptize him with his knowledge of understanding what's for. That's what, and that's what why he had to rebaptize those people in Acts 19. Yeah, Brian. I'm sorry. I, I, what did he say, Hogar? Yes, yes, but. Okay. Okay. To the sinner. That's why in my proposition, I wrote, it's essential for sinners. Now, what you may believe, and this is a false belief, but what you probably believe, and I don't know, so I, I'm just saying may probably, is that babies are born sinners, so they have to be baptized. That's the Catholic doctrine. But Ezekiel 18 says, the child does not inherit the iniquities of his father. G, uh, the Bible says in Luke 2, 23, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy unto the Lord. There is a time when an infant gets up to where he understands the gospel. He understands God's word. He realizes then he has violated it and the wages of sin is death. That's when he dies because he was alive being without sin. And now he understands God's word. Now that's when that man needs baptism. And that's exactly why Philip told the eunuch, if you believe first and you repent, you may. Well, Peter said repent, but go ahead, go ahead Brian. Yes. Yes. They got it, but they see the relevance of baptism, but then they have a false doctrine on infant, infant sin. So in, in babies, Jesus said, except you become as these little children, you can't in no wise enter. We've got to become innocent like little children. They're innocent. They can't. In real quick, I just have to say this real quick. One time I was discussing this with a Catholic minister, and he said, Steve, the world's full of sin, and a baby's born into the world. Therefore, he's born a sinner into a world of sin. I said, if that's true, if a baby were born in a watermelon patch, that'd make him a watermelon. He said, I got to go. And I would have too, because being born somewhere doesn't make you something necessarily. So uh, every man who sins... He's accountable for his own. So, uh, if you don't mind, let, let's move on. There's three or four other people raising their hands. I, I know you've got a lot, and I know you, we'll continue our, our discussions. Uh, yeah, I forgot. Is it Ed? Edward. Okay, yes, Edward. Yes. Um, the scripture says that the blood of Christ was God. Yes.
Okay. Because what the gospel does in its power is it illustrates to us how filthy we are, like you cited. And when you see that, the power is God has given you his judgment and his determination. Now it's up to you. What are you going to do? you want to stay filthy or do you want to be washed and made righteous? What, did you hear him, Holy? Yes, yes. It, it, is, it is, is absolutely free will choice, okay? We must choose. Choose you this day whom you will serve. That's the concept. And so, um, it's a good question, good thoughts. I appreciate it. Y yes, Steve. Okay. But what I will ask you is, he said, that's how Abraham was made righteous. Abraham Let's go to that text. Let's go to James chapter 2 real quick, and, and then we can go back to uh, Genesis 12 if we need to. But Yes. Excellent. Ex excellent, Steve. What does he mean in Romans 4? Yes, excellent. Excellent, excellent. So in one passage, now, now here's the problem, okay? Follow me. One passage, he's justified by faith, not faith alone. Well, how does faith come? By hearing God's word. God spoke to him. He responded to it, and he's justified by faith, not faith alone. Faith is at work at this time in his heart, and he's choosing to do what God says. And that's why, now, here's the dichotomy. James 2 says it this way. Romans 4 says it this way. You've got these two verses going like this. I've got them going like this. I say both are happening. Now, now let's take a look at James 2 and see how that works real quick. In James 2, um, look at verse 14. Let's start right there. What does the prophet, my brethren, though a man may say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? That's rhetorical. If a brother or sister... Be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you saying to them, Depart in peace, be ye warm, filled, notwithstanding you give, uh, not give those which are needful uh, to the body, what doth it profit? Even so, faith that hath not works is dead, being alone. Yea, a man may say that thou hast faith, I have works. Show me thy faith, uh, uh, show me thy faith without thy works, I will show you my faith by my works. There's the idea. What I'm doing illustrates my faithfulness. But now watch this carefully. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well, the devils believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, vain man, that faith without works is dead? Was not Abraham our father justified by works, watch it, when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? He had to do something. He did it by faith because God told him to do it. And that's how he was justified. Now, he's mentioned in Hebrews chapter 11 as well, the hall of faith. faith. He said by faith, amen, not faith alone. He heard God's word. God spoke, he heard, and he responded to it. That's how faith works in a, in a saved, faithful person's life. So what we have is saved by faith, absolutely. Saved by works, absolutely. They have to work together. We can't pull them apart. Okay, Romans 4.11. <clears throat> Paul there is making the distinction between the Jewish believers at Rome and the Gentile believers at Rome because the Jews were bragging it up and they thought they were exceptional. We're the chosen of God. We're God's children. And what Paul is illustrating in Romans chapter 4 is that the law doesn't make them any better. And he uses Abraham as the example because Abraham existed before the law of Moses. Yes. 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 Let me let me let me explain that. Let, let me explain that for just a moment. Let, 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 let's explore that for just a moment, okay? 
Abraham believed God, and it was accounted unto him for righteousness. Amen. I can say the same thing. Hogan can say the same thing. Anybody who's saved can say the same thing. I believe God, and it's imputed unto me for righteousness. But does it, I don't believe alone. The devils believe and tremble. That's the illustration James just made. I just read it. But now follow me here for just a moment. The word belief in the Bible is used in a technical term as a synecdoche. It's a gram, grammatical term. And all a synecdoche means is a part which stands for the whole. Okay? A part which stands. If I took my car key right now and I said, Steve, would you please run to the corner store and uh, get me a Coca-Cola? You don't have any back there? I want Coke. This key is a part that stands for the whole. He can't get on this and ride it to the store. Take my key and go to the store. What's he going to do with the key? He's going to put it in my car, start it, put it in drive, drive. But this, when I say take my key, and this is a synecdoche key. A part. So when the Bible says believe, it's not just a mental ascent to something. It is a part that stands of a whole of the system. Do you believe Jesus' words? Do you believe what he said? Do you believe the gospel? It's not just the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. It's not just that in itself. The gospel entails all of the New Testament teachings. It's the entirety of the gospel. So when, when, the, when it's put to believe in God, it's believing his words. The words which I have spoken, the same should judge you, Jesus said. Paul said, you're judged by my gospel. Well, do you believe the words? Do you believe Jesus? Because don't call, don't, why call you me Lord, Lord, and do not that which I say? If you believe me, you're going to respond to it. So this idea of belief, and that's John 3, 16. Uh, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He said that to Nicodemus, who he just told, you've got to be born again. And then in John 4, 1, Jesus made and baptized more disciples than did John. The context there, before and after this belief, you find baptism, water baptism. Literally. Do you believe it? You've got to believe it. To as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. You may receive him. You may believe. You have that power now. What are you going to do to, do it, to get it? You have to become the sons of God. You've got something you've got to do. Uh, yes. Well, now hang on. Uh, you're getting, we're getting into the old covenant is a different thing. Now, what God told Abraham to do may be different than what he told us to do under Christ. But I want you to consider this. Everything in the old covenant is a type of something. It's a shadow of something. We agree? So when God told Abraham, get thee to a land which I will show you later, Abraham did what? He left the land of the Ur of the Chaldees. And the Bible immediately says he passed through the Euphrates River. He did what? Now, you can laugh, now, you, but now watch this carefully. In Deuteronomy chapter 28, Moses gathered together all the people, and he said, you wicked people, you saw the miracles that God did when he delivered you from Egypt. You saw them, but you didn't perceive what it was. Now, they saw the water parted. They walked through it. Now, the Apostle Paul clarifies that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. He said, I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, how that when you pass through the sea, you were all baptized under Moses being in the cloud in the sea. Now the people that was there, they saw the water. They're doing exactly what Mike's doing. All he sees is water. And Moses is saying, your heart's not perceiving that through this, God is doing a greater thing with you. Spiritually. That's exactly. That. Now, Paul corrected that in 1 Corinthians 10. And that water, when they would pass through this water, it's all through the Old Testament. They had to cross the Jordan into the Promised Land. Do what? Go through the water? Pass through? They had to cross the sea when they left the Egyptian bondage. They, they, it's all throughout. Abraham had to cross through the Euphrates. Now, these words are spirit in their life. Okay? Don't make it carnal. Okay. Well, Paul explicitly and emphatically said when they passed through the sea. And the last time I, 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 there's one right here. I mean, it's an wow. ocean. It, it, being baptized, yeah. So it's an immersion within the cloud of water. And in, so, okay, are there, are there any, we could save that for further discussion. And we, we'll elaborate on that. I'd be happy to. No, I think it's time for Mike to answer a question. Yeah. 
All right, does anybody else have any for me? Or? Okay. Except I'm your guest. And then, and then while he's in loving care. And then I'm open to answer some questions, but I want to be clear, I'm always saying. And then the same's gonna happen. When he's in Lovington, our audience is gonna have one quote. I I stand corrected. Quote. I stand corrected. Hey man, come here. That's all right. Okay, uh, we'll take one more, Edward? And forgive me, I, I'm a little deaf in this series, so if I don't hear, I apologize. Sometimes I have to have a holder. Give me. Okay. The, the question is, what does the Lord do as far as, does it forgive you of your sins? Or does it Excellent. Jesus is the only one that can, can forgive sins. Okay. The power is not in the water. The power is not in the person administering the baptism. I've I, I baptized over 150 people in the last 10 years. I no power in me at all. The power is in the gospel. The power is in what you know God asks you to do through his gospel. And there's where the power is, okay? If God said, you need, I will save you here, and this is how, there's where the power is. Not, and it's not holy water. That's not the idea. That's, that's the idea we've been taught, we've been trained. But that's, the idea is that that's just simply where God said he's going to save us. See, here's water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? So the power is in God to do it where and how he said. Now, like I said, and it's a silly illustration maybe, but if God said we've got to go to Chicago to be baptized, no power in Chicago. That's just where God promised to do it at. Uh, <laughs> Mario, go ahead. Col Colossians chapter 2, being buried with him in baptism, uh, being, uh, yeah, having uh, received God's operation on them. Yes. Uh, uh, the circumcision of the heart. What aspect of that are you looking at? Colossians chapter two, being buried with him in baptism. Oh, that's where God operates on you at. Very good. That's where. Here's what we do. We say we have faith in God, right? But we don't have enough faith to let God operate on us. Where did God say He would operate on us at? Colossians chapter two. Let me read that real quick. Mike's getting antsy, and I don't blame him. In Colossians chapter 2, look at where God said he's going to operate on you at. <clears throat> Excellent, Mario. Thank you, brother. Colossians 2, verse 11. In whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, not the old, in the putting off of the body of sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. Now, when I submit to God, he promised to operate on me. Where? In baptism. What's he going to do? Remove my sins, make me a new person, I'm going to be born again. In, in water, yeah. So, uh, very good. Anybody have anything else? I mean, and we're, we'll take more questions tomorrow. I cannot emphasize, I cannot, how much I love you all and how much I appreciate you all. And uh, I know God's word will not return unto him void. Now, there's something going on here that's very special. Very special. You know, it, it may be peculiar to the rest of the world. It may be odd. But it's right and it's real because God made it that way. Not me. I didn't write the Bible. So I appreciate you all. I love you all. And I thank you all. And I appreciate God for this great opportunity more than anything. Thank you all. No, but I, I'm open to take questions. I did not know those rules, so I stand corrected. Right. I should have said that I would never imply that you would not stand. Okay. I just thought we would give, give you some too. You always yeah. confirm your I, I'm open to questions. Understood. I understand your, your, your point of reference there. I, I do. I, I get it. And, um, I disagree with uh, sacraments, and I disagree with uh, things in that regard, of course. So. Peter?
appreciate that. Uh, now, I do want to make a, just a quick distinction. When I hear the word baptism, I don't automatically think of water. So I believe you're talking about, I had said that water baptism is burdensome. Okay. And, and I'll show you why I believe that. So if I'm a, and again, I, I wouldn't want to baptize dead people or, you know, uh, but is it a, a baptized living people or however uh, Steve had mentioned it there. I'm trying to reflect back to something. Right, we're not going to bury a living person, we're going to bury a dead person, right, okay. So, and I would agree with that, of course. Um, that being said, the reason why I said it's burdensome is here you have somebody that has seen the working of God in their life. And again, I was talking about water baptism, I'm not talking about the baptism of the things of God. I believe you are to believe and be baptized, meaning be consumed by the things of God. Now, here you have somebody that ha believes that God has done that in his life that God has consumed me and that has produced the fruits of the Spirit, has produced everything that I mentioned there in 2 Peter chapter 1, which tells me that this will guarantee me an entrance into the kingdom of God. However, here I stand being told after doing that for years, seeing the working of God in my life to the point where witnesses around me, remember where the Apostle Paul said that, you know, in the, in the testimony of many witnesses, uh, he said that to his spiritual son Timothy, I've done that. I've had that work in my life, yet... Here I stand being told that unless I get into that tub in a certain way, and again, we're going to get into that a bit more tomorrow, where we have to kind of figure out the order of baptism. What, what are we saying? Uh, are we saying that, you know, I have to, Steve had mentioned believing in being baptized. What do I have to believe? How deep do I have to go? How old do I have to be? These are things that need to be brought out in detail. Now, to get to your second point, because there's a second point I know you, you, you asked there. Um, so my point would be that I, I believe that it would be burdensome to ask me, a man that, by the way, I have been water baptized, and uh, a man that has lived out 2 Peter chapter 1 by the grace of God, not that a man would not boast. I believe that's the spirit of God working in and through me. So again, that's why I believe it's burdensome on my behalf. Now, to answer your second question, uh, why would we baptize them, right? Why would we want to baptize? That's why I started out my negative saying, I'm not a Baptist. I don't believe that you need to get into that tub. I believe that it's simply an emblem. I don't believe, as I had listened to a recent uh, debate between a, a member of the Church of Christ and a Baptist preacher, that Baptist preacher believed you need to believe and be water baptized to confirm your faith. I don't believe that. I believe you need to believe and be baptized, meaning you need to be consumed by the Spirit of God so that the fruits of the Spirit live through you, that are seen through you. So again, that's why I believe that would be burdensome. I don't, I don't see the need for physical water baptism in a salvific plan at all. Why would we, again, because we're not saying that that's the moment that they're dying. Again, I have a lot we could bring out a bit more on Colossians 2 tomorrow, uh, what it meant for those saints to be buried with him in baptism. Uh, however, I don't, again, I don't place a lot of value on the tub. I don't really make it my business to try to water baptize people. I believe that if you want to put an emblem on, again, it's a Boy Scout gets a, a you join the Boy Scouts. I often use this illustration. You join the Boy Scouts, you're, you go to the meeting, you pay your $5 dues, you learn a little bit from the book, you're a Boy Scout. However, when I was younger, I joined the Boy Scouts and my family didn't have money, so I couldn't get the uniform. I was still a Boy Scout, I just didn't have the uniform. When I got the uniform, it was great. I got to show up to the camping events and have my uniform on, and I was, I was no more, no less without the uniform. But again, it was a great emblem. So that's why I would baptize somebody in water. So uh, Steve earlier made a point, and we made a point in your, uh, one of your negatives on one point. You pointed out very clearly that in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, this is the wash in his blood. Mm -hmm. Now, if we would agree, okay? And Steve argued very distinctly from Jesus. 
So I. Absolutely. That's a good point. Because, I mean, you and I are the same. Yeah, again, I, I will say this just in very brief. I, I believe I leaned in on the conversions there in the book of Acts. And what I had mentioned there is that uh, what I'm not going to allow is kind of picking and choosing from those conversion areas there. What we see very clearly here in uh, chapter 9 of Acts, uh, it says this of the Apostle Paul. This is, a part, this is part and parcel of that baptism and everything that we're saying about Ananias going to Saul. It says this. But the Lord said to him, go, for he is my chosen instrument to bear my name before the Gentiles and the kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Again, there's a very particular thing going on there. This, again, all throughout the book of Acts, and Holger, we know this. The book of Acts is a transitional period where there's very particular things to that generation happening in the book of Acts. To demand that this is happening upon everybody, again, this is not, and I will make the charge, and again, I will deal with this a bit more tomorrow, I'd make the charge that your experience in water baptizing people, the conversions that you've experienced, are not synonymous with what we're reading here in the book of Acts. They're not. They're not chosen. You weren't sent. It wasn't a spirit that took you and brought you somewhere else. Again, I believe that. I could believe in election, the providence of God in that regard, where he would send me. But as I've come to understand your view, you can't. And again, you also don't believe that Paul was chosen, because in order for Paul to be chosen, he had to be water baptized, apparently. Which I would say, no, Paul was chosen. And the water baptism was just simply a as I've marked out, the, the, the uniform for what he was already being chosen for, walking in. So, uh, again, I'll, I'll deal with that a bit more tomorrow, but I, I believe that that's pretty clear there. Question? Well, I'd say yes. I believe that God gives you perseverance, gives you, again, I believe in election. So I believe God calls and perseveres. He, he's the one that's doing that so that you might not boast. So yes, and again, obviously, I don't add much uh, to the water. Mario, sorry, not to, I didn't mean to point to you. Well, the same way the book of Acts said Lydia, her heart was opened up. The same way the people on the road to Emmaus, their hearts burned within them. I've, I've known that. I've, I've known that in my life. I know that, again, uh, that we talked about how do I know? Well, in 2 Peter chapter 1, it said, make your calling and election sure. And if you remember, I read to you the traits that you need to possess and increase in so that you would know your entrance into the kingdom of God. So, again, in my life, I know that the Lord has worked. I turn to him. Again, a mind would not even turn to the Lord, as I read you the Old Testament text, where a mind won't even turn to the Lord unless the Lord's spirit has caused him to do so. So I know that, I know I've looked to the Lord, and I know I've possessed and increased in the things that make me effective and fruitful in the use of the knowledge of God. But you just said what you have done. You said, I did this, I did that, I did this, I did that. And then that's when you receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Is what you've done and progressing the thing in 2 Peter 1, is that not, uh, would you say, works? I'd need to replay that because maybe that was my error. I don't believe it's anything that I've done. I believe it's his spirit that has called me, even made me look to him. And then his spirit that has persevered in me to allow me to possess an increase in the things that make me effective and fruitful in the use of the knowledge of God. So again, I don't know that I said I did anything. His spirit caused me to turn to him. His spirit causes me to obey. His spirit causes me to persevere. After, so when you say, sorry, I'm going to cut you off. It's all right. When you say his spirit, do you mean the, the spirit that you baptized with? Like, do you mean after you um, baptized with the Holy Spirit? I don't baptize. See, absolutely. So then, how do you know that you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit if those things come after you've been baptized with the Holy Spirit? How do you know beforehand? Because you said you have to possess this and possess that, and then that's when you would know. But if you baptized with the Holy Spirit before those possessions and things, so how do you know that you baptized with the Holy Spirit? Like, how would you know? Well, again, I think this will also lead in on this is something that I'm going to approach tomorrow. I think we're also having a misunderstanding about faith. I think that, again, faith is provided by God, and faith is a faith that perseveres. So, uh, again, the questions as to before I demonstrated the fruits of the Spirit, how did I know? I didn't know. I know because I demonstrate the fruits of the Spirit. How do I know I'm in him? I produce the fruit that remains. That's what Jesus said. 
You will produce the fruit that remains. You will remain in me, the vine, and you will produce the fruit that remains. How do I know I'm in him? I produce the fruit that remains. That's, again... What do you mean I don't have to believe? That's a part of the fruit. Believe and be baptized. But you said the fruit came after the Holy Spirit left him. You said he knew because it was the fruit that he produced. Right, right? his fruit, yes. So that means before the Holy Spirit left him, he didn't have Holy Spirit, right? Right. So, so how do I know? Because I produced the fruit, right. So you didn't believe the, you didn't believe before the Holy Spirit left him. No, of course not. I believe he causes you to believe. It's his work. It said in those texts I read to you that his spirit will cause you to obey. Is not believing, obeying. His spirit will cause you to obey. His spirit will cause you to walk in these things. We believe that. The question is not, will the spirit do it? How will the spirit do it? We can address that tomorrow. Sure. Thank you.